I think I think we're going to give a few minutes here um, to see if more people come in. And right now, not one person that's a sponsor, a cobot sponsor on this bill is here. So I'm going to give them a few more minutes. Okay, if we can all take our seats. <laughs> Welcome to the um, Science and Tech and Energy Committee. Uh, as is tradition, we will begin our committee meeting with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I will ask Representative Noel to please stand and give it to us, please. Hearing is not open, and I would like to uh, say that right now uh, Chairman Vos is in the Senate giving a, uh, a testimony, so he'll be back shortly. In the interim, I'd like to introduce uh, Senator Avard to introduce Senate Bill 303. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Chairman Committee. Uh, uh, and th thanks to the committee, I'm Senator Avard, uh, District 12. And uh, I am the prime sponsor of this bill, and it was at the request of the Department of Energy and uh, so I'm going to ask you to treat me nice because I got your chairman in my committee right now. So <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I'm the prime sponsor of this bill. And basically, it, the bill adds uh, battery storage projects to the use of renewable energy fund. It deletes required re renewable energy generation incentive programs and authorizes a political subdivision incentive, rebates, and grant programs using this fund. This bill also modifies reporting date by the Department of Energy concerning the Renewable Energy Fund. And again, like I said, it's at the request of the department who is here also, I believe, to answer some really technical questions if you have them. But uh, so this bill was, um, it, it makes changes on how the, energy, uh, the Renewable Energy Fund is administered to better align with its current happening in the energy sector. The Re Renewable Energy Fund is funded through alternative compliant payments made by electrical distribution utilities and competitive suppliers who cannot acquire enough renewable energy certificates to comply with state law. So the department then uses these funds to provide grants and rebates to renewable energy projects that generate more renewable energy certificates in the future. Needless to say that the energy sector is moving by leaps and bounds and the state program needs to be able to keep up with the market changes in order to ensure that the limited state funds are making the difference in these projects happening, rather than just subsidizing projects that are happening anyway. Perhaps the most recent, uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, this bill directs the department to establish programs specifically for political subdivisions. 
This will help our cities, our towns, our counties to reduce their energy costs by reducing pressure on property tax. The Senate Energy and uh, Ener recommends the passage of uh, by four to zero in the full Senate passed on this on a voice, voice vote. And I hope my friends here in the, in the House will vote the same way. So if you have some light questions, I'd be happy to answer. Other than that, I got to get back to committee. Thank you, Senator. Does anyone have a burning question for the Senator so we can get out of here quickly? Representative Kaplan. Thank you, uh, Permit, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you Mr. Oh, Acting Chair. And this is a quick question. I mean, uh, it says in the analysis that it, it adds battery storage projects. And yes. That, that's great. I just don't see it in the actual bill as, as, as it come to us. It looks like it took the battery storage language out when, when it was amended. But so I mean, just could you clarify that for us? Like I, where, I, where I, it I cannot, that? but I, I'm sure the department can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perhaps uh, we can. Uh, the next speaker might be able to, to uh, clarify that. Representative Corman, do you have a question for the senator? I had the same question as Representative Kaplan. Great minds think alike. Seeing no other thank questions. You. Seeing no other questions. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I need. I know you need to get back. So thank you. You yes. do. I'm sorry, we want to let you go, Senator. I know you have stuff to do. Um, my question was around uh, whether there was any discussion in the Senate on this bill about the change that cuts generation from support under the REF funds. Was, was it discussed what kind of impact there would be if we were no longer supporting um, renewable generation projects? Because that was you know, where it was focused before, and this kind of changes that focus. I, I think the emphasis is, is the, uh basically fund new projects and not funds that are already existing. And I think that's that's where the emphasis is on this bill. Okay, thanks. Yeah. With that, Representative Thomas, do you have a burning question for the Senator? I'm sorry? Do you have a burning question for the Senator? I do. Well, I mean, he's the prime sponsor, correct? Yes. So I, I do have a, a question of the prime sponsor. Yes, I do. Great. Thank you. Thank you for, for acknowledging that. Um, on line uh, 16 and 17 on uh, the first page of the bill, it says in italics, or may modify existing programs or opportunities. Could you identify what those are? I'd like, I think the department can actually speak to that better than I could. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that being said, Senator, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. I will call on the next uh, speaker and the only one I have right now, and that is... Mr. Josh Elliott from the Department of Energy. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, uh, Josh Elliott. I am the Director of the Division of Policy and Programs at the New Hampshire Department of Energy. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, the sponsor, Senator Avard, for introducing this bill on our behalf. Um, so I'm going to just do a walkthrough of the bill of what's what's here and what's not here, um, and then happy to, to take questions um, as the committee may have. So walking through the bill um, as amended by the Senate, Section 1 is just a reporting date change. Um, the uh, You may recall in um, House Bill 2, there were a number of changes made around when alternative compliance payments were made. Um, this uh, inadvertently shortchanged the time that staff have to actually review those payments as they come in to ensure that they're actually the correct amount that should be paid. Um, so this just by reverting it, uh, pushing it back a month from October to November, um, restores that initial timeline um, that was contemplated. It just didn't happen to get caught in House Bill 2. Uh, section 2 of the bill. Um, makes two changes. Um, the uh, aforementioned from uh, Representative uh, Wendy Thomas uh, regarding uh, modifying an existing uh, programs or opportunities um, basically gives us the authority. Um, the, the previous process um, had been uh, done through a PUC docket process. Um, this would give the department the ability to change and modify programs, obviously including stakeholder input as, as part of that process. Um, to be able to make those sort of minor tweaks as as um, uh, the situation dictates, 
The second section, uh, the second piece of uh, section two, 19 lines 19 through 24, um, is the reference to the municipal program that Senator Avard spoke to. So this is a specific direction to the department to create that uh, program for municipal or for political subdivisions, so cities, towns, counties, etc. Um, we have found um, through process with federal funds that there's a tremendous amount of demand for solar, in particular, um, from municipalities. But the current program structure does not allow, um, does not provide enough funding in order for those programs, uh, for those projects often to get off the ground. So this would allow us basically a specific carve out for um, political subdivisions. Uh, section three is just a cleanup. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm skipping section, th I'm sorry, section three, Roman X, as well as section four, um, repeals the statutory requirement for the residential uh, rebate program. Um, and this is not because the department doesn't want to offer residential rebate programs, it's that the statutory construction is particularly uh, strict um, in that it requires us to give a rebate to anybody who's had a solar array that's been installed uh, since 2008. So this array could have been put in place in 2010 and then um, they could come in and get a rebate if they haven't already gotten one. Um, the department is committed to um, reviewing a uh, 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 reviewing uh, a new you know, a new residential program in the solar area. Essentially we uh, the existing program um, uh, has been um, trying to think of how to phrase this. I, I should say as, as part of this, we have done a public uh, stakeholder um, initial session um, back in the fall, reviewing the comments. One of the common points was that this residential rebate program is not functioning as though it, as it should. Essentially, it is just serving to subsidize uh, solar projects that would have happened otherwise, rather than actually incenting new ones from happening. Um, so as part of that process, um, we of course will engage with other stakeholders to figure out what that right program design looks like. Um, in order to be able to provide those uh, rebates to um, solar projects that might actually make a difference rather than ended up just subsidizing existing ones. Um, section four, Roman uh, 11, um, is just a cleanup um, of the existing statute, just retaining the um, direction that we do the program every year. And then section five is the effective date. Um, there was a little bit of confusion um, regarding battery storage. It was in the original bill as introduced by the Senate. The amended analysis did not capture that change in the amendment, um, so that's why you still see that reference to battery storage there. It was removed by the Senate um, based on comments from uh, that were heard in the Senate hearing. Uh, however, I do want to note that the fiscal note um, is still accurate for the bill, um, with the exception of any of the references to battery storage are, are no longer there. So with that, I am happy to take questions from the committee. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. I might make mention before we get into questions um, <clears throat> congratulations on taking over. Uh, we understand that Mr. Uh, Griffin Roberge is moving on. Uh, we thank him for his uh, being here all, the, all this time and thank you for taking over as now. So I'm sure uh, 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 you both will be doing just fine. <laughs> I, uh, we're, it's a loss for the department, but um, I can't say, uh, you know, we're, we're very happy for him uh, as much as we're going to give him a hard time about it. <laughs> Very good. Okay, uh, Representative Reynolds, question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, particularly since the prime sponsor pointed to you, uh, could you enlighten us on the uh, Senate's thinking and the department's current thinking uh, in res respect to the removal of references to battery storage from this bill? I mean, uh, as probably the next testifier's uh, testimony describes in great detail battery storage is obviously an important and emerging piece of uh, particularly the efficacy of renewables and so uh, you know are the programs are the programs you envision now going to support um, you know integrated solar and battery storage or or what Sure. Thank you for the question. So this came up during this, as you uh, as you mentioned during the um, uh, during the Senate hearing, um, about a question about whether or not battery storage in itself actually generates renewable energy certificates. 
Um, it, yes, uh, which it does not. Um, so the, uh, the question that was raised by some of the uh, testifiers during the Senate hearing was, had pointed that out and said, these don't generate RECs. The underlying premise of the Renewable Energy Fund is to incent uh, new um, sources of generation that produce RECs. So in theory, right, it should be a self-fulfilling uh, uh, cycle, which there are not enough RECs. These RECs go to, to um, fund projects that then generate RECs. In theory, in the future, fewer RECs are then needed, so alternative compliance would go down in sort of a, a continuing cycle like that. Um, as part of that process, right, you would have to be able to generate those RECs. This um, battery storage in itself does not generate RECs because it is just either taking electrons either off the grid or behind the meter usage um, from an existing uh, generation, which then is then used by the consumer and doesn't actually go out onto the grid. Um, so there was that, that question about whether or not it actually um, generated RECs and therefore would be an a appropriate use of the Renewable Energy Fund. I will say during our stakeholder sessions, uh, we did ask the question. Uh, a number of folks uh, who commented responded positively that yes, a, a battery incentive program would be good. Um, the, uh, the testimony in the Senate was limited to um, individuals taking issue with it um, rather than being in support of it. Follow One follow-up, go ahead. Well, thank you for that response. I guess in follow-up, my, my question, I mean, obviously batteries don't generate any electricity, but as I stated in my opening question, batteries increase the efficacy and the value of renewable energy systems. So I, I think that distinction and the, the Senate doing what they did is um, kind of myopic. Uh, so I'll ask you now, um, you know, I'm, I'm gratified that at least uh, remaining language in the bill refers to renewable thermal and electric energy projects for political subdivisions. Is it the department's position uh, or does the department consider battery storage to potentially be a valuable component of renewable energy systems that could be supported by the Renewable Energy Fund? I would, <clears throat> I would answer that as a qualified yes. Um, there is a policy decision to be made there about whether or not the Renewable Energy Fund should be used to um, provide funding to projects that don't in and of themselves generate RECs. Um, that is a policy decision that the legislature can make and direct the department to do so. Thank you. Representative Harrington. Thank you. Um, question is, well, we're on the topic of, of battery storage. If, if, make, make sure if I'm following this correctly then. What you're saying is that most battery storage, if not all, is associated with renewable energy projects. So a wind project, a solar project, for example, produce uh, renewable energy and they receive RECs for that. Now, those RECs are either sold to a, um, one of the utilities or one of the electric providers, or they're, uh, you know, although those providers provide alternate compliance payments instead. But, but they're already, that electricity that's produced has already been awarded RECs. Now, when it goes into battery storage, it simply sits there, and then some hours later, it gets re re-released back to the grid. It doesn't produce any more electricity. So paying Do we have Rex a question to, coming, please? Okay, this is what I'm saying. The question's right here. Paying Rex to battery storage would appear to be paying double Rex for the same amount of electricity, once when it's produced and a second time when it's released from storage. Is that correct? That that would be correct if we were awarding Rex for uh, electricity that was discharged from batteries. However, right. that's okay. that is not contemplated in this bill. Well, that's what was changed in the bill by the Senate. Uh, no, that was that was wasn't part of the bill as originally introduced. Okay. But um, there was the question that the policy question of whether or not renewable energy funds should be used to provide incentives for battery storage. Okay. Right. Follow up. Well, I thought you had a follow up with the second question. But well, I'll make this one real quick. Uh, 
you mentioned the uh, uh, alternative compliance payments. The, the goal of the original program was that we want to produce more renewable energy. So a long-term goal would be to see alternative compliance payments go to zero. So all of the money from the REC, all, the, all that money is being produced is going to produce more renewable energy. How, where will we add in that goal of getting, of making it so we don't have alternate compliance payments? Um, that is an excellent question. It is one that is often um, impacted by policy decisions in other states. Um, within the uh, ISO New England region, the RECs can uh, be traded interchangeably. Um, what counts as a class one here is a different class in Massachusetts, is a different class in Connecticut, et cetera. Um, there are, other states have different requirements in terms of what can be settled, what kind of RECs. Um, there's a, if you look at our annual report, there's a very complicated chart that sort of shows all the overlapping, what counts as what, where in New England. Um, but that being said, if New Hampshire were sort of an isolated by in and of itself and those RECs did not go anywhere else, right, you would have that sort of mechanism um, that would function in that way. Um, but there are outside factors, right? There are policy decisions that are made by other states that then impact what the REC market looks like. So just by New Hampshire in and of itself um, can't necessarily um, – uh, that sort of that envisioned process um, is impacted by outside factors that are beyond the policy control of the state of New Hampshire. Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Acting Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Elliott, for taking my question. Um, so what I see in the amendment before us um, is a, a couple of changes that are called out by the analysis and then the first one about battery storage actually no longer mo is modified by the existing amendment. Um, what I see is that we are saying that the renewable generation incentive programs as they currently exist would go away and they would be replaced with programs that would be um, designed by the Department of Energy to support municipalities and political subdivisions um, in adopting renewable energy projects. Would that be a safe analysis? Um, no. So we are not undermining any of the, the current programs that exist, with the exception of repealing the specific residential solar program due to the efficacy issues that I mentioned earlier, but the, the, with the desire and the goal and the intention of the department is to replace it with something better after going through a robust stakeholder process. But the existing programs that we offer, for example, um, the um, uh, non-residential um, competitive grant program, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, low moderate income uh, solar grant program, the commercial uh, solar rebate, the commercial wood re uh, wood pellet rebate, as well as the residential wood pellet wood pellet rebate, um, would remain unchanged. Okay, so I have a follow up. So first of all, I would like us to establish how much money is in the REF in any given year so we can have an idea of how much money we're talking about. And then I have a follow up from there. Sure. Um, I would need to look back at our latest dedicated funds report um, to to get the exact figure as of where we sit right now, um, as well as check with our business offices to an exact balance. Okay. Um, we ACP revenue sort of varies from year to year, depending on the, the variety of factors um, that I said in, in response to Representative Harrington's um, question. Um, last year, we received, I'm trying to recall off the top of my head, I think it was about seven-ish million dollars in ACP revenues. Mm -hmm. um, so far, this year has been committed uh, four million dollars uh, in programs. Um, part of it was uh, a contemplated of looking at um, these statutes and bringing this bill forward and engaging in those stakeholder conversations um, to make sure that the programs that we have are effective, they're working the way that they're intended, and they're actually beneficial to folks. You know, it would be, um, you know, it wouldn't serve the, the people of the state of New Hampshire if we came up with programs that nobody wanted them, right? Um, so we want to make sure that those dollars are being spent in the most effective way possible. Okay, and that- Can we, uh, uh, before we get to your second follow-up, can I go to Representative Munns first, then we can, we can come, come back to you? Okay. <laughs> All right, you're off the hook. I'll, I'll, I'd like to give the representative a, ch a chance here. Go ahead. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, my apologies for arriving late, and if I'm asking a question that was already uh, answered, uh, my apologies as well. Th thank you for taking my question. Um, you know, sec Section 4 eliminates um, four or five very specific um, sections in statute currently. Um, 
can you explain why that's necessary? Sure. Um, the uh, program in question is the residential program. The statute itself is is very um, strictly constructed in to the point of where the department is required to offer a rebate to any uh, residential solar system that's been installed since. 2008 that has provided has not received a rebate. So in theory, you could have, which is the example um, I mentioned earlier, you could have somebody who's installed a solar array in 2010 come in and ask for a $1,000 rebate. Um, we did conduct an initial stakeholder session uh, requesting written comments in the fall. Um, the common point among all of them was that this current program is not functioning uh, well or as intended. Uh, so with the strict statutory construction that's outlined uh, currently in statute doesn't give us the flexibility to make it, for example, means tested or to target it to certain areas or do sort of all those sort of programmatic changes um, that would make it a more effective program. Um, that being said, the department is, is committed to coming up with a replacement for this program that we would um, put into place, obviously, after stakeholder input and things like that, um, to make sure that the program that we're designing is actually um, doing what it's intended to do rather than just what you know we on the inside think would be effective, but talking to those folks out in the field. Follow-up? Follow-up. So why would we eliminate something before we have a replacement uh, identified? Um, the program without the, the remove or I says, wait, without this change, we would continue having to basically operate the program as is. And there's a question about whether or not that is the best use of money in the REF to continue spending on a program that we know is not effective. Representative McGee, as you can have the final question. Oh, thanks. Um, I think there was a hand up over there too, but, um, so my question is around our, we don't seem to have a lot of information around behind the meter solar. And it seems like those individual solar installations actually are having, having an impact uh, on demand. It may be the place where there's the widest spread adoption for the way our policies have been structured in the state. So do we have any information about, about um, the, the current impact of behind the meter solar, which I think is kind of elusive in terms of the the numbers that we look at. Thank you for the question. So part of it is a bit tricky because it is all happening behind the meter and the, the grid as a, uh, and in large doesn't see it because it, it's not the only, I should say, the only way that it's seen by the grid as, as, a, as a larger entity is by a reduction in demand. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm sure has been mentioned multiple times in this committee, the ICE New England app has the great um, uh, demand curve for all of New England. You can see that it sort of comes up in the morning as, and then there's a drop off in the middle of the day and then there's sort of a speed, steep, steep mm -hmm. spike as folks are getting home and as the sun is getting down. Um, but in terms of, of that, uh, that generation or that re removal of the demand is really dependent on those individual homeowners, depending on what they're doing, what they're doing at those times, as well as weather conditions and a variety of other, other factors. Yep. I, I get all that. I, I guess it's, it's hard for us to understand if we're using the REF in the correct way or designing the right programs, if we don't have that full picture, if, if you could, if your agency could try and develop that for us so we had a better understanding of where we are saving currently in the addition of renewable generation, then maybe we would be able to design a program that really got us where we want to go faster. Yeah, and that would be the intention, sorry if I can respond to that, um, that would be the intention of the department of making sure right those dollars are going to the right places rather than subsidizing somebody who already has one. Okay, uh, well I will Representative Thomas, um, unless you have um, a brand new question, let's make this the last one, and I think we're starting to go around in a circle here. So what's your question? Uh, it has not been asked before. Um, referring to lines 20 and 21 on page 1, this is developing an incentive or rebate program or a competitive grant opportunity for re renewable thermal and electric energy projects for political subdivisions. My question is, what is the department's plans on how to inform and publicize that these new programs exist? Sure, so we um, 
probably taking a step back, um, we would do a stakeholder process to figure out what exactly would work for municipalities who are engaging with, uh, with folks, either be the developers or the municipalities or through the municipal association and other entities um, to figure out, you know, what are towns really looking for, right? We don't want to design a program where nobody wants it. We want to design it where the, the demand is. Um, that being said, um, we would publicize it. We would work with folks like the Municipal Association. We work with town energy committees to make sure that these um, programs are well noticed and well um, uh, well advertised to the, the folks who would actually be in the shoes of, of drafting these applications for when the competitive grant programs open. Follow up. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, it sounds like there, there could potentially be money left on the table. What would happen to that? I'm uh, I'm sorry. Where where would money be left on the table? If if application if not enough applications come in um, or the stakeholders don't know about it and they don't apply, it sounds like there there's a potential for money to be left on the table. Yeah. Um, so in that circumstance, thank you for the question. In that circumstance, um, what has been the policy of the department is to just carry forward the funds into the next year um, for the program. So additional funds would just sort of roll forward. Um, there is a requirement that we rebalance funding um, as the um, uh, within a two year period, just to make sure that the spread between commercial industrial programs and residential matches what the actual electricity demand is. Okay, um, I think we've covered the realm of questions here. Thank you, uh, Josh, Mr. Elliott, and the, the, the new Griffin Rivers. Well, uh, temporary at least. <laughs> temporary. <laughs> um, I don't, having, I don't, thank you very much. I don't see any other. There you go. Uh, I'll be so quick. <laughs> yes, okay. If, uh, please be quick putting your card in next time because uh, there we have a senator here waiting. Absolutely. So um, I apologize. I wasn't planning to speak, um, but just wanted to jump in. I heard a number of questions that I thought uh, I could clarify on. Um, Sam Evans Brown, Executive Director of Clean Energy New Hampshire. Um, we are in support of this bill. Um, we were in support of it when it was uh, looking to add battery storage into eligible uh, uses of the REF. We heard the concerns about the fact that battery storage does not generate uh, wrecks and therefore shouldn't be considered. But you know, I frankly think that may be, that concerns may be a little overblown. Um, there really is a need for those type of funding in uh, the state of New Hampshire. But even as written, I think we would support this bill. There is a real need for funding streams for municipal projects, and our circuit rider program sees that every day. Um, there, there are a lot of really innovative and exciting projects that municipalities are working on that don't have flexible sources of funding that can that can fund them. Um, and just as a again a, a very quick note, we also do not see the residential solar rebate as being additive. We believe that at this point that that program is really just sending money to folks that would have installed solar regardless. And so we support the elimination of that program and using those funds for a better and higher purpose. And that we've come to that conclusion through a lot of consultation with our members that are in the residential solar space. So um, that's all. Okay. One question, please. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Representative, Representative Parshall. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Brown, for your testimony. Um, my question is, um, I understand from your letter, uh, we're not talking wrecks here for batteries, but because this bill was originally directed towards batteries and not towards replacing uh, a part of our RSAs with a yeah, as of yet to be written law, um, I'm feeling at a loss when I'm reading this bill. I'm thinking that we do need something to flatten the curve and batteries are what we need, if not wrecks, something else. Can you explain why the focus of the bill deviated from that to replace um, RSAs with as of yet unwritten policy? Uh, so, so I would agree with Josh Elliott's characterization that the concern is that the, the renewable energy, the renewable portfolio standard is a self-balancing policy, right? So you, if you have not enough renewable energy credits, uh, alternative compliance payments are used to create projects that generate enough renewable energy credits that make the alternative compliance payments go away. So, so I, I understand that concern that, that the uh, investing in technologies that do not generate renewable energy credits undermines the policy design of the renew renewable portfolio standard. Currently, there's only one program that I know of that is is uh, putting 
money on the table to make batteries happen. It's the Clean Energy Fund, which came from the 2017 divestiture of of PSNH's the Eversource's generation assets. Um, the the residential the residential battery program is fully subscribed. The commercial battery program, um, the you know the rebate levels aren't high enough, and so there's that we are trying to work with Eversource and the DOE to, to figure out how to get that money out the door. But it's very limited funding. I mean, the, the whole clean energy fund is $5 million. Uh, and and the, the, the programs that are well designed, that money goes out the door very, very quickly. So uh, we were in support of the initial idea because although there was the potential that it might mess with the RPS design, there is a real need. And there aren't many programs in New Hampshire that are, that are getting batteries deployed. So we viewed that as a trade-off and something we were willing to support. Okay, with that, thank you very much, Sam Evans Brown. I declare closed the uh, public hearing for Senate Bill 303. Since we're running a little late, we're going to move right on to the next bill, which is Senate Bill 388, and welcome Senator Pearl. Uh, thank you for being here. I know you're busy. Uh, appreciate you coming before us. Well, good morning, members of ST&E. For the record, my name is Senator Howard Pearl from District 17. I live in the great town of Loudoun, and uh, pleasure to be in front of your committee today. I am here to introduce Senate Bill 388 relative to the administration of utilities by the Department of Energy. Th this bill was a request from the DOE, and it makes some technical changes to uh, the RSAs that govern them. And I'm going to let uh, Josh explain those in detail because he'll do a better job than I will. Additionally, uh, the department has requested an amendment since the Senate hearing. There's a couple of more technical changes they've discovered they'd like to make. So they're, they're going to uh, present you with language for an amendment. And I'm fully in support of that. If the committee decides to add that onto the bill, there shouldn't be any objection from the Senate on that. So with that, I'm going to uh, hopefully let you call Josh next and let him give, explain all the technical uh, aspects of the bill. Thank you. Does anybody have a question directly for the Senator? Representative Kaplan. Thank you, Mr. Acting Chair, and uh, I'll make this, you know, hopefully you'll be able to answer this, Senator. Um, what was the intention of changing homeowners to households you know, on line uh, 20, that's section two, section three net metering? Sure. Uh, it says, you know, low moderate income used to be homeowners, now it's gonna be households. What, is, what was the thinking behind that? Well, thank you, Representative. It's great to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. And, uh, I'm, going to, I'm honestly going to let Josh answer that. It was a technical change that the department requested as they felt better represented uh, the language than what we currently have. Thank you. You're Seeing no further questions, thank you, Senator. I know you're busy. You can get back to your real job. Well, your, your chair is over there in front of us testifying, so it was a good swap, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you. Let's see. Um... That. Okay, so the next, the only other pink card I have on 388 is Mr. J Josh Elliott from the Department of Energy. Another request from the Department of Energy. I'm sure you will describe what the changes are. Thank you. Thank you for coming again. Good morning, Mr. Acting uh, Chair, members of the committee. Again, Josh Elliott from the uh, Director of the Division of Policy and Programs from the New Hampshire Department of Energy. Um, just like to uh, reiterate our thanks uh, to Senator Pearl for um, introducing this bill for us. Um, so I am going to go through sort of a section by section um, of the bill um, to give you a sense of what it does because there's lots of little sort of little changes here and there um, that will help the department uh, function more effectively and um, be able to um, be able to provide better value to the citizens of the state of New Hampshire. Um, going through the section by section, uh, section one and two, um, this is just a clarification that uh, public utilities are required to comply with department orders, um, with section two being the penalty mechanism for not following those. Um, the commission currently has this uh, statutory authority while the department does not, so that just adds in, or the department um, in those two sections. Um, section three, um, to uh, Representative Kaplan's earlier question, um, the change from homeowners to households does two things. Um, it uh, 
both makes the statute consistent, um, households is in other references in that section, um, as well as ensuring the clarity that um, homeowners has a very distinctive, you actually own the residence that you live in versus household, um, makes it clear that yes, renters are eligible for this program as well. So it's not just constrained to those who actually, um, who own their own home, um, whatever it may be. Um, sections four and five of the bill. Um, this is another technical cleanup um, regarding the date of when the um, Renewable Energy Fund annual report is filed. Um, these sections do not conflict, uh, conflict with what is in Senate Bill 303. So you can leave these here and leave the one in 303 and nothing's gonna get knocked askew. Um, but just make sure that those um, dates all then line up um, with the new timeline that was established um, in House Bill 2 for when all of these mechanisms happen. Uh, section 6 of the bill, um, this gets into our assessing authority, um, which is what we do um, to the utilities um, in order to provide that regulatory oversight. We conduct an assessment on the utilities for that, um, for those services. Um, the um, for entities that um, make less than $10,000 in revenue in a particular year are exempt from the statute. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times we don't know what a entity's revenues look like until we send out the assessment. So we'll send out the assessment and then oftentimes we'll get back, oh, you know what, here's our exemption or we want to be exempt, um, which is fine, but then you have to recalculate everything based on that exemption. So this provides a very clear window and direction that if you are filing for an exemption to the assessment, here's the period in which you do it. So our business office isn't constantly recalculating, recalculating, recalculating every time one of these things comes back in. We do communicate with these entities frequently. Um, you know, things fall through the crack, there are staff changes, things like that happen, but that that um, makes it clear that our business office is just not continually churning and recalculating these assessments. Um, section seven and eight of the bill, um, these are just holdover statutes um, that existed when, uh, that were carried over from the former um, officer strategic initiatives. Um, they're no longer relevant to the department and can just be removed from statute. Um, I realized based on the, the title of the sections about personal wireless services. Um, I just want to make it very, very clear that this does nothing to change municipalities' um, ability or authority to regulate cell phone towers in their own communities. So that is kept intact. This is just removing the department from it because there were there were just some straggler statutes there. Um, that being said, um, as a uh, as uh, Senator Pearl um, referenced, we have two additional changes um, that we would like um, to see made that are just purely technical. Um, if the letter that I believe is, is going around is on the back side of the page, sort of references those two um, changes. One of them is a change to section three, um, just clarifying that um, for this um, program that only new solar installations are, are, are eligible rather than existing ones that then become one of these. Um, and then adding in um, at the very end of the um, section on line 23, um, allowing the department to rank these projects based on their demonstrated project readiness. Um, so essentially, we just want to avoid the situation where someone could come in, propose this great project that um, says provides, you know, 100% of the output to um, LMI um, customers um, for benefits on their bill, um, but is clearly not project ready. And there's certain things that demonstrate project readiness, such as site control, um, looking at interconnection. Um, there's a whole, uh, you know, finance, firm financing plans and things like that. We wouldn't want to see um, bad actors coming in with projects that then um, eat up that capacity. Um, that means then viable projects, which may have slightly lower because they actually have calculated what they're supposed to be doing. Um, then get knocked out. So while there might be this sort of pie in the sky um, project that comes in, um, that would get selected be without having this criteria to be able to judge based on project readiness. Um, the last two um, requests are, are combined, um, are actually um, dealing with uh, House Bill 232, um, which I know Mr. Chairman, you sponsored last year, dealing with thermal recs, um, just adding our favorite phrase um, by rule or by order um, to those two sections of statute that were amended um, to allow that alternative metering methodology. Um, that'll make it clear that we can do this by order um, as an interim before the formal rulemaking process begins. Um, 
So I've had a couple of conversations with folks who are who work in this area, um, and this is a this is a um, certainly a desired change that would help the department be able to do implementation faster than um, current statute would allow. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to pause and take any questions. I realize it's a lot of disjointed pieces all over the place as technical cleanup bills tend to be. Thank you very much. Questions from the committee? Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Elliott, for taking my question again. Um, I have lots of questions, uh, but I'm just going to start with uh, Section 6 on uh, line 11, page 2. And my question is, it says, any public utility or other assessed entity, could you define for me as part one of this question, what what other assessed entities would qualify or would be required to be noticed here? That is a good question. I would like to just double check with our business office to make sure I wouldn't want to fathom a guess and have that guess be wrong. Okay. Um, but I'm happy to, to get back to you and the rest of the committee as to what those other entities would be. Thank you. And then on the bolded um, part from line 14 on until it concludes uh, that paragraph on, on line 18, I was a little confused because it, it basically says, you know, you, you, you need to request this exemption. You need to get your request in. Here's the period. It's from July 1st, beginning of that year. Uh, and we need to see it by the 30th. So that's, I guess, a 30-day period. Mm -hmm. My question is, are there any processes around this? Is it push? Is it pull? How do people become aware that this law is changing so that they can comply? And because it just it seems a little vague in the way it's defined here, and I didn't know if there was any other statutory language anywhere that actually would uh, help people understand what their requirements are. Yes. Yeah, so these, um, and now that you've asked that question, I've I've thought of one of the assessed entities that might be uh, so competitive suppliers, for example, or would be considered an assessed entity. I am not sure how much further broad it gets, but that's at least one of the answers to your previous question. Um, Regarding the process, um, this is something that we do on a yearly basis. Um, these entities are required to register with the department so we know who these folks are, we have their contact information. Um, certainly any change like this would be communicated well in advance of saying, you know, as the assessment period comes up, if you're, you know, with this language, if you're seeking to file an exemption, you know, you, this is the period in which you can file an exemption before we go through all the work of actually calculating everything. Um, so that, that outreach would happen to make sure the entities aren't caught by surprise and somebody doesn't file something on August 1st and then, oh, sorry, no, like there, there would be, we would communicate these changes to those assessments. Is it an electronic form or is it paper? Um, that is a good question. I can check with our business office on that. Um, I believe... You know what? I'm not even going to fathom a guess. I will check with our business office folks who who work on this and um, and get an answer for you. Further questions from the committee, Representative Kaplan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Elliott. Uh, I have a question about the uh, the the uh, the additions that you would like to see in this in this bill, and that's uh, the you know the the handout that you just gave us. Addition two and three. It seems that that has to do with with uh, useful thermal energy and the recs that they can receive. Uh, I'm just wondering, could you quantify the the number of of plants, if you will, that would be that would be affected by these changes? Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, so, uh, House Bill 232, um, which uh, passed the legislature last session, um, uh, sort of sought to be able to meter. Um, uh, I should say, get around the, uh, not get around, address the issue regarding small thermal um, rec producers. Typically, this would be, um, you know, if it's a small facility, um, um, all the way down to the size of somebody's own uh, wood, wood pellet boiler in there that they use for home heating, for example. Um, the statute, the statute um, as written, has the word meter in it, which has a very defined definition of, um, but also uh, needs to be a revenue grade meter um, in order to be able to match those tolerances because there is, um, your, in theory, where you would be generating renewable energy certificates from it, you need to have a revenue grade meter so you know exactly what is produced in order to know exactly what um, uh, the number of recs that are being produced from that facility. Um, those meters are quite, quite uh, very expensive. Um, so for the smaller systems, it does not make any financial sense to be able to, uh, to actually install one of those because whatever installing one of those types of meters is going to be far more expensive than any of the, the 
uh, revenue that you would generate from any of the recs that are being produced. Um, this was um, brought forward by a number of folks last year um, about trying to find a, a happy medium in between the two of developing sort of this alternative metering methodology for those smaller facilities that doesn't require one of those revenue grade meters. Um, so they would be able to be eligible to um, produce um, thermal recs as well. <clears throat> Follow up question. If I can. Follow up. So I don't. Uh, so would the rules or orders produced by your department would that have to do with the, with, with uh, requiring or allowing those kind of meters? Um, it would, as the statute as it's constructed, um, requires us to uh, approve an alternative metering methodology that is proposed through a stakeholder process. Um, but the way that the statute is constructed, um, it would require us to go through the entire formal rulemaking process, um, which is can be long can be a long process. Um, and obviously, there's a there's a question with um, of just changing one smart, small part of the rules versus a holistic, looking at all the rules in, in, in a holistic sense, because then you, if you change one little piece here, you might inadvertently cause an issue somewhere else that is then can't be rectified. Um, by adding the language um, by rule or by order, um, it allows the department basically to issue an order which has the full effect of, of um, rules as an interim until the formal rulemaking process, looking at all the rules within that section, PUC 2500, in case anyone's curious, um, done on a holistic basis, but make sure that the statute itself can be implemented before that holistic rulemaking process goes through. Further questions for Mr. Elliott? Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, Mr. Elliott, <clears throat> these amendments to this procedure, just procedurally, when are we going to see them? What's What's the plan here? Um, thank you for the question. Um, I would defer to the committee. I'm happy to work with anyone who would be interested in in uh, in um, having OLS draft these amendments. Happy to work with OLS, um, but I just offer them to the committee for their consideration um, for addition to the bill. Thank you. Since you have provided written uh, versions of the amendments, we can take it from here. Thank you, Representative Noel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, in your descriptive uh, uh, paper, uh, you refer to sections one and sections. Sections one and two, uh, where the public utilities are mandated to comply with the department orders, uh, does that also does that work in conjunction with the PUC, or is it an exclusive uh, uh, mandate of authority to the department? Um, thank you for the question. Um, no, it is adding uh, so that the existing statute that you see here being amended um, is for the Public Utilities Commission to have that authority. Um, our request here is just to add the department so we would have the similar authorities to the PUC in just in just in these regards. Okay, thank you. Additional questions, Representative Thomas. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In section eight on line 30, um, there, the repeals relative to guidance and rulemaking by the Department of Energy, can you tell me what specific aspects of guidance and rulemaking are being repeal repealed? Um, sure, uh, thank you for the question, my apologies. Um, yes, those um, sections um, deal with um, personal wireless service facilities um, that had the department, the, the well, I should say, at that point, it would have been the Office of Energy and Planning um, in the early 2000s um, was tasked with coming up with um, a number of sort of finite um, proposals around the siting of, of personal wireless facilities, cell phone towers, um, that has then been superseded by um, uh, further developments by the municipalities themselves in terms of how they look at these things. Um, so it's sort of, it's no longer relevant um, and it's no longer within the purview of, of, the, of the department. Additional questions? Seeing none, I wanna thank you, Mr. Elliott, for being here to- Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thoroughly describe the bill and also describe your suggested changes to it. I have no more pink cards on this particular bill. So I will close the public hearing on Senate Bill 388. And in five minutes or so, we'll open a public hearing on House Bill 391. Thank you.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. It's 1030, and we would like to start the next public hearing. The next public hearing is on Senate Bill 391, relative to electric grid interconnection for certain customer generators. And I would like to call on the prime sponsor, Represent uh, Senator uh, Avard from the Senate, to introduce this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for the record, I'm Senator Kevin Avard, District 12. And uh, thank you, committee members. It's good to see you all again. How are you? All right. So as the prime sponsor of this bill, uh, so businesses are always looking for ways to control the, uh, control and keep uh, down the cost of such uh, costs like electricity. More and more businesses are looking to installing solar arrays to help reduce their costs by producing electricity on site. The interconnection for small solar arrays is typically straightforward, uh, although for larger solar arrays, like those of businesses and interconnections can be very complicated. This already uh, complicated interconnection process is then further complicated by the lack of clear rules of the road and for businesses, solar developers, and for the utilities. This bill is intended to help break the log jam uh, with the process of providing uh, those clear rules of the road in the PUC 900 rules. I know I've heard from companies in my district about the issues and I'm sure many of them, uh, have, you've heard from them as well. And if you haven't, I think you're going to hear from them today. This bill amends, is amended by the Senate and would have the Department of Energy create drafted rules to address this issue in a comprehensive way, ensuring clarity for business, looking to install solar as well as solar developers. And the De Department of Energy is taking this issue very seriously. They worked with members of the Senate Energy Committee on the language to make sure that the bill is workable and implementable. And while there are some areas of agreement about where these rules, what these rules should look like, there are other areas of disagreement um, between those involved in sorting out the issues, and it will take some time. And I know there are several companies here that can speak to their experiences with this issue, as well as the Department of Energy, who will be able to lay out uh, how this process will work. Uh, and having spoken uh, with somebody just a few minutes ago, uh, there's definitely uh, going to be some proposed amendments because of rules. And uh, so with that, um, I will take any questions you have, but I mean, go ahead. <laughs> Senator, thank you very much. Uh, I would remind members that we have 12 pink cards here. We're gonna hear a lot about this legislation. Representative Corman has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, for yeah. taking my question. The bill as introduced had a deadline for the rules to be adopted by December 31, 2024, with the updated procedures in effect uh, the next day. And the amendment removes that deadline. Uh, why? It needed some time to, uh, to create the rules. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't have been workable. Follow up? Given that, why not a deadline a little further out rather than just this amorphous bill that just says there will be rules and we don't know when? Right. I think we adopted 60 days. Did we adopt 60 days? Mike, are you in here? Mike Licata? I think, I think we had mentioned that. Didn't, didn't we adopt 60 days? It says that it will open a proceeding, but it doesn't say anything about when the rules would be in effect. Uh, I believe I, it was my understanding it was after 60 days of passage, I guess. Okay. We got the answer to that question. We'll deliberate on that. Thank you. Right. Any further questions for Senator Avard? Representative Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you please tell me why this hasn't been opened as a docket by the PUC? I cannot. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Seeing none, I want to thank you, Senator, and I also want to ask you if you could uh, talk to me briefly before you leave. I'm going to call on the next person to testify, and then I'll meet you right over here if, if we could do that. We're in exec session, so. Okay. Yep. So next up is um, Representative Jim Horgan 
of uh, Farmington who wants to talk to us about a potential change. Morning, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Uh, my name is Jim Horgan. I represent Farmington and uh, District Stratford County District 1. And what I have is uh, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, an amendment to SB 391 uh, 241206 Hotel. Uh, I see this as a way of kind of refining the interconnection process. But to be perfectly honest with you, I do not understand all I know. I do have Mr. Campbell, the Honorable Mr. Packy Campbell, uh, with me here today, who is behind this and uh, well-versed, and I believe can answer all your questions. And that's all I have. I'll attempt to an answer any questions you have, but I'm going to drop it all on Mr. Campbell. Sorry. Okay. Uh, questions from the committee? Representative yes. Partial. We have a yes. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you for testifying. Do we have a copy of the amendment? So, the procedure, <clears throat> according to House rules, is that we do not consider amendments at a public hearing. I do have a copy of an amendment that was handed to me right before the meeting began. We do not, however, consider amendments at a public hearing. Out of um, Respect for Representative Horgan, I allowed him to speak here. I just spoke to Senator Abard about whether he had seen this amendment, and he had not. I will allow Mr. Campbell, who I understand is, uh, who has requested this amendment, to speak briefly about the subject and the kinds of changes that will be made, but not speak to the amendment itself. So Mr. Campbell, if you want to come up and give us an, a synopsis of changes that you would like to see made, then we'll consider those. Thank you. Okay. And, and, I, and I do recognize the full power of not being able to get this to uh, Senator Avard. We did email him copies. We did reach out to his office. We did call his staff and ask for return phone calls. So I do respect this process a great deal. Um, I think the problem with the bill you guys already identified, there's no end date for when they're going to make rules. Um, if based, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Packy Campbell. I am a, a real estate developer. I own a solar company. I'm a former state rep here in New Hampshire. Had the opportunity to serve like you're serving, and I enjoyed it immensely. Um, I also was before this committee in August of 2022, and the committee was gracious enough to do a committee amendment then, and we passed a bill as related to uh, timing of net meter credit billings. And I think that the amendment that I'm looking for is similar to that, that the problem is actually in the rules. And I think the law needs to be clarified where there's stronger problems created by the existing rules in PUC 900. And that's why I'm asking that if you're gonna pass a bill that says, hey, just go make rules, say we're gonna make rules and they're gonna be on A, B, C, D, E, and we'll make rules around that content, that there'll be specific criteria such as 10 days to respond, that you'll provide an email or a way to communicate with the utility. Right now under the current rules, the utility sends you a do not reply email, it's kind of problematic, you can't really communicate with them, so I'm sorry, I think we need to put in law that you will give the customer generator or the contractor ability to con con do. So very simple things that I think are reasonable, common sense things. Um, you never know how these are gonna go, but I, I guess the, the problem that I have with the bill, it, with the current process that I'm asking to be amended is that I appreciate Senator Avard saying, hey, we need rules, but as is typical, the amendment says, we're gonna open a hearing and you're never gonna know when you're gonna see those rules. And for reference, we haven't seen any rules on the bill that you passed two years ago as it relates to payments. And the utility refused to make those payments until the rules were passed. And I had to remind them quite aggressively that they need to follow the law. And after 18 months, I finally got a letter from uh, Eversource saying, all right, Mr. Campbell, we will start following the law. We were just trying to figure out the process. 
So literally, we have some utilities that are acting above the law. So that's why I think it's important that we put specific things in the law. Because with respect to Senator Avard, this is my folder on the RSAs and the laws. There's over 100 pages of rules in PUC 900, and I've highlighted a couple of them. Um, one of them for interconnection agreements over 100 kilowatts, the, the rule is essentially that the utilities will just tell you what they're going to do in their annual policy. There is absolutely no rules. They just do it. So I think there's a need for rules there. Um, when you look at responses, it says within 60 business days of receipt. For those of you who know what a business day is, that means three months before they even have to respond to me as a customer. That's why I'm saying specifically in my amendment, you have 10 days to either say, hey, I'd like more information, or your application is complete, or ideally approve it. The other uh, section of the rules that I think creates a problem for the utilities in that, that they basically say that the event that you need an upgrade, so you need to go from a 10 kilowatt transformer to a 25 kilowatt transformer, they actually review the whole interconnection agreement. They then have you install the system. They then have you verify that you really wanted to upgrade the transformer. They then have you get the local approval from the exhibit B from the local utility, which means you now spent your 80, 70 grand on your solar system, then they'll start the process of what's a work order with the construction department from one department asking another department to do something. And that's sort of created in these rules. So one of the things that I'm trying to ask you to do is basically say, if you have a service, this is a 60 amp breaker. It flows in two directions already. That happened long before there was solar. It is a stupid device. It, it either has 60 amps in or 60 amps out. 60 and 60 doesn't equal 120. That you, you asked the question about behind the meter. That behind the meter means that, that if I have solar here and it taps the line and this breaker's calling for power, it goes into the house. If it goes out of this line, it goes onto the grid, it goes right into the next house as if it was behind the meter. So one of my biggest problems is they make you do these, these system impact studies, usually on the projects over 100 kilowatts. It took three and a half years to not even get my approval in one project. I spent $37,000 on a study, and I'm not gonna try and save the committee some time, but basically, there's a capacity map. So in the amendment, I talk about if you're under the capacity map, you're approved by right. Because you're spending three years doing a study to the information that's available on their website. Think about that. I spent $37,000 to study whether or not I could do a one megawatt project, a customer generator project, when the capacity map said there was capacity for seven and a half megawatts. If you further look at uh, uh, Eversource's website, their capacity map is based on an analysis of this, as if 50% of their substation is offline for service or broken. So this capacity map is already reduced to 50%. Then you further look at their own website, it says if you're doing a project and it's over the capacity map, then you do a system impact study. That's literally on their website. But that's not what they do because they can do whatever they want is they delay you for years and years. So I have two projects that have been critically delayed. I've spent thousands of dollars on studies that's available on their website. And worse yet, folks, because of what I just explained about the power, I'm studying a bridge that my kilowatts never go over. Kilowatts, it's physics. It goes, she has solar, it goes to his house, maybe to his house. It doesn't go across the table over there. You shouldn't be studying a substation in Dover for a customer generation project in Rochester, yet they're requiring you to do that. So that's why I'm asking for an amendment in law that says if you're under the capacity map, no system impact study. That's basically what I'm saying. I'm also, the other real big issue with this, and I'll try to be quick, Chairman, I know I'm pushing the envelope here, um, is the the idea that if you need a service upgrade, my, if you don't remember, my, cus, my company does dual access trackers. We do primarily 20 kilowatt systems. They are twice as powerful as a normal solar system, so they're really like a 40 kilowatt system. So almost without exception, if you're a residential homeowner, you have a 10 or a 15 kilowatt transformer. So I need an upgrade. I can go to the construction department. I can create a work order. I've been a developer for 25 years. I've built all kinds of stuff. I know how to do a work order and get a new service. They do not let you do that process until you're done with the other process. So in law, I'm saying if I submit a work order, you're gonna give me an estimate for that service upgrade. If I come in and say I want 60 amps, 600 amps, 
or 1600 amps, and that's as large as it'll be for a customer generation. This is customer generation, this is distributed energy. I support the current law here in New Hampshire of small solar diversified to the grid. If you pass this law, these amendments that I'm looking for, you'll see that balanced distributed energy throughout the grid because the market, the entrepreneurs like myself, will be driven to go to spots where there's capacity because it's gonna be easier to get the approval. So with that, I, I, I hope you have questions. Can you summarize the five problems you would like to solve and each problem summarize it with a single sentence? Eversource is struggling. They're a bureaucracy that's not helped by the legislators. And I think the problem I'm trying to solve is that struggle. That we have a problem as installers, as regulators, as government, as industry, as utilities. I'm trying to solve that problem for everybody. Okay, great. Thank you. Representative Lewicki has a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't see a fiscal note on this. However, what I see are, are a lot of things that are going to cost money. Basically, these uh, upgrades, installations, and so forth. And these are... Are these going to be socialized to the ratepayers through the um, whatever process? Because you know each of these things that you talk about is going to cost somebody money, and if all ratepayers are going to pay, then this does not seem fair to me. Thank you for that question, and Representative, that is a, that is the heart of the matter. One of the biggest problems this bill solves is if you look at line twenty-seven, it said the utilities product cost us for all associated secondary upgrades. The customer generator should be responsible for cost of all those secondary upgrades. I clarify in law because, okay, sorry. Yes. Re what? Remember the committee doesn't have that amendment and we're not considering an amendment. I agree with you, you 100%. Make a general statement. If you did, if you were to pass this bill, I would suggest it be amended that the customer generator pays for all utility upgrades. Currently rep representative, if you do a new service, there's rules on what utilities can charge. They have to give so many feet for free, so many telephone poles for free. So there would be cost shifting if you went in and said, I'm going to do a solar system, and you follow their current rules of what they're allowed to charge you. So what I would propose, if you're going to pass a bill on rulemaking, put in law that customer generators have to pay for those secondary upgrades. All right, thank you. Further questions? Representative Kaplan. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Campbell, for, for coming in. Um, I don't have a question about the amendment because we're, we're not supposed to talk about the amendment, but I just am curious about the process. Were you involved in the stakeholder hearings that the, that the department held uh, and, or the PUC held to determine what kind of rules they would like to see in terms of interconnection? Were you part of that, uh, those meetings? And in, if, you, if you were, like, what, what was your, what was your um, impression of those meetings? Were they helpful? I want to be kind. I'm wearing my kindness jacket. I think that some of the scariest words in the English language is, hi, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. That's generally how I feel. Um, so um, my involvement as a former representative has not been, you know, I'm running five companies. I'm working full time. I'm father of five. I'm married. I'm doing what I can to get down here and hopefully educate you guys in the process. But to answer your question more specifically, I've done interconnections in Massachusetts. I've done them in Maine. I've done them with Liberty. I've done them with Unitel. I've done them with Eversource. I've done hundreds of solar interconnection applications. I understand what I, I believe is the problem. And I think I'd like to hopefully have you take up my amendment, which I believe is the solution. And that input, because I, I've applied for a formal complaint with the DOE, because I don't think, to answer your question, I don't think they did an adequate job in their hearings. I don't think they've done an adequate job in their rulemaking. So 90 days ago, I did form a file complaint about the interconnection process and the fact that it cost me over a million dollars, guys. Think about that. It cost me over a million dollars in lost revenue on this one project. If I wasn't a well-heeled 54-year-old guy with five different businesses, Eversource put back on the table bankruptcy for me as a developer. There's a major, major problem with interconnection for customer generation, and I hope that this committee will work with Senator Avard, work with the Senate to do an amendment that gives just three or four little guidelines things like pay for the secondary utilities, let us do regular work orders, let us automatically connect if we're smaller than the service side and under the capacity map. That's all I'm asking. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks. Now, you submitted a pink card to speak on this bill. You have just done that. So Correct. I'm going to move on because we have 10 other people. Who I appreciate like to speak. the opportunity, and I hope that this will be a fruitful discussion and we'll all learn something. So I will not be calling you back up. That's fine. Okay. All right. Thank thanks. You. Just wanted to make that clear. Yep. All right. Let's next hear from uh, Jonathan Greer. Thank you all. Representing uh, Wirebelt. And thank you, Representative. Good morning, Mr. Greer. I understand you folks uh, need to move along this morning, so we wanted to get you early in the process. No. Now, now it is. Now? Everybody can hear me all right? All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Jonathan Greer. I'm the president of Wirebelt, a fifth uh, part of the fifth generation of this family-owned business. I'm proud to be here, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about us and our experience with solar. We are a global business with locations in England and Germany, headquartered here in New Hampshire. We supply conveyor belts to a variety of industries, food, electronics, agriculture, automotive, and more. Our company's belts have transported spent uranium rods, parts for space shuttles, they've helped sort blueberries, and a whole lot of pizzas and chicken nuggets. <laughs> We are just a small part of it, but in today's world, most things we buy have been on a conveyor belt at one point or another. A little over 100 years in, Wire Belt has done well. We have a great place to work, full of fantastic people. We've been recognized by Business New Hampshire many times as a great place to work, the most in the state, I believe, and we have many great benefits. Among them is a profit-sharing plan, which has been impactful for many retirees. I hope we are an even better company in 100 years, but New Hampshire is not a low cost place to manufacture, labor, healthcare, taxes, and more contribute to a constantly changing landscape that we need to manage well to be globally competitive. When we relocated to Bedford, New Hampshire in February of 2023, we were planning for the future. We invested in wrapping the 120,000 square foot facility in an insulating skin to better manage the temperatures it gets cold here in the winter. We've taken steps with our equipment, air supply, lighting, and more to manage our costs. One of our largest investments on this front was the solar array on our roof. 2,455 solar panels were planned, which make up an 840 kilowatt AC system designed to offset 90% of our projected demand. We took out a loan to help fund these projects, looking at them as an investment in our future. Unfortunately, we have yet to see the full benefit of our investment in solar, despite being in our building for over a year now. Over this past year, after moving to, the new, to our new location, we saw our electric bills peak at $59,000, 173, or yeah, $59,000 in one month. That's more than a $52,000 increase in one month over our previous location. Knowing that we're, we had invested in solar and were paying interest on those loans made some of those months particularly frustrating. Candidly, I want to spend our money someplace else. I think that we can do that to the benefit of our employees and our business. For context, if we are up and running in April as planned, it will have been roughly two and a half years since our application and roughly one and a half years since we had a signed agreement. And those have been expensive paperweights on our ceiling or on our roof for over a year now. Please ensure the timely adoption of comprehensive interconnection. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Greer, Representative Corman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Greer, for taking my question. I just want to make sure I understand. You have the panels. Yes. The photons are hitting them. Yeah. Something's coming out of the panels, but you can't use any of it because you're not interconnected. None of it is actually going into your own uh, wires and circuits within the building. Yeah. So uh, we've got many people who can answer that much better than I can. Um, I think that there is a capacity thing where we can't turn it fully on until we get a recloser installed, I believe. But there are other folks here who can answer that better than I can. Okay, additional questions for Mr. Greer. Seeing none, I want to thank you, sir. Appreciate thank you, you being here this morning.
Next, I'll call on Jonathan LaPointe of Associated Grocers of New England. Welcome, Mr. LaPointe. Good morning. So my name is Jonathan LaPointe from Associated Grocers of New England, uh, right down the street in Pembroke, New Hampshire. And I am here on behalf of Russ Greenlaw today, who's the senior vice president. Uh, he apologizes he could not be here. He's currently at an AG board meeting this morning. So I will be reading his testimony on his behalf. Chair Bowes, Vice Chair Thomas, and members of the House Committee on Science, Technology, and Energy. Thank you for taking the time to hear the perspective of our state's business community on this important legislation today. And a special thanks to Senator Avard for his leadership on this bill. I serve as the Senior Vice President of Sales for Associated Grocers of New England. And I am here today as both an AG representative and a New Hampshire citizen to showcase support for Senate Bill 391. AG is the largest retailer owned wholesale grocery distribution center in New England proudly serving the needs of independent retail grocers since 1946. Since our humble beginning, AG has consistently and considerably grown. Our headquarters in Pembroke, New Hampshire, currently spans just under 500,000 square feet to accommodate the hundreds of employees and thousands of products necessary to provide for the communities we serve. As you can surely imagine, a facility of our size and nature has significant energy needs. While large amounts of resource consumption is certainly not unique to AG, our passion to approach problems through a socially responsible and solutions-based lens is. In 2021, we were able to align both our fiscal goal of reducing operational expenses and our commitment to sustainability through the installation of a rooftop solar array. Our one megawatt AC solar array is made up of 3,400 solar panels that sit on the top of our facility, generating up to 1.45 million kilowatt hours of clean power annually. At the time of installation, it was the largest rooftop array in the state and today offsets nearly 20% of our total electric load. We are incredibly proud of this investment and want to expand. However, the journey to get where we are was not without its challenges. Because of past obstacles and the lack of process rectification since, any further pursuit of an array expansion has been severe, severely quelled. For example, our first grid impact study forecasted unprecedented costs for interconnection largely due to estimates for specific equipment that had been knowingly procured by other companies at significantly lower prices. To be clear here though, pricing was not the problem. It was the lack of set regula regulations to govern such a process that removed any opportunity for challenge or dispute resolution. Additionally, equipment necessary for, equip for interconnection was substantially, substantially delayed without any advance notice, and therefore, we were unable to turn our system on until six months after the original go-live date. To further exacerbate the issue, AG was ultimately overbilled nearly $40,000 with a less than urgent response or correction from the utility. I'm confident we can all agree on the immense frustration caused by paying for an investment while it was essentially inoperable, especially so when you are overcharged. Again, it is not the supply chain disruptions nor the billing errors that are the fundamental problem, just as it was not the aforementioned cost discrepancies that caused our heartache. Simply put, the current system in place, or lack thereof, makes positive initiatives such as clean solar energy an uphill battle. As you can see, AG has been directly impacted by the insufficient clarity, misinformation, and unpredictability involved in such a process. But it is not for our own benefit that we primarily plead this case. Implementing fair and transparent interconnection procedures provide all New Hampshire citizens, individuals, and corporate entities alike a level playing field to fully embrace the opportunities solar energy provides. With that, we respectfully ask this legislator to en enable the Public Utilities Commission to integrate this demonstration of equity for the betterment of New Hampshire's communities far and wide. 
We appreciate your consideration of our perspective, given our experience, and we invite you to reach out with any questions or tour our operations in Pembroke at any time. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Representative Carmen, you have a question? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. So uh, the existing array that you have that's operational offsets 20% of your electric load, more or less. Correct. And you're looking to expand? And, yeah. And uh, how much uh, additional capacity uh, would, would the expansion handle? So thank you for the question. So we are looking at, right now, I don't know if you've ever been to AG, so we've got you know, a warehouse, an office, and a warehouse, basically. So there's a dry grocery warehouse and a refrigerated side, both roughly the same size. The dry grocery side of the warehouse is completely covered in solar panels. So we still have the whole other half of the building that we could put solar panels on. And at the same time, we're looking to expand our current footprint. We're outgrowing our 500,000 square feet right now. So we've begun... Uh, the process of expanding our warehouse here in Pembroke. And it would be great to, at the same time, expand our solar array. Um, but unfortunately, that's, like I said previously, an uphill battle right now. So follow up. Okay, follow up. Yeah. Thank you. So it sounds like the expansion would be about another 20% or so of, of your needs. Yeah, there are other issue, issues involved that were, this is a part of our challenges with solar. Net metering is also another. Right, so, um, so, so my, my real question is, if, if, it's not even, if it's not meeting 100% of your needs, <laughs> then what's the problem with interconnecting? Shouldn't all those electrons just be going right into the building? Yeah, we consume much more than that, though. Um, and I think it was... The problem was when we, they're all running now, that one half of the building, but at the time of installation a year ago, for the previous testimony, it was it was a challenge getting everything hooked up and it makes us hesitant to move forward with any additional projects. If that, and if that doesn't answer your question, I can definitely go back to the team and get back to you, yeah. Okay, we have eight more people who would like to testify. Representative McGee has a question. Thank you. I just wanted to ask uh, how long of a delay you experienced. Uh, thank you for your question. I believe it was about six months. All righty, I want to thank you for coming to testify to us this morning. Thank Next, you. I'll call on Kate T. from New Leaf Energy. And Kate, I would pronounce your last name, but I can't quite make it out on the pink card. Is it? Tongo, Tom. Tomei. 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 Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No problem at all. It's a hard one. Thank you for Go coming. ahead. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Chairman Bose and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kate Tomei, and I'm a, the Director of Interconnection Policy at New Leaf Energy. New Leaf is a leading developer of solar and storage at both the distribution and transmission scales in service of our mission to accelerate the transition to a world powered by renewable energy. New Leaf is headquartered just over the border in Lowell, Massachusetts, and many of our employees live in New Hampshire, including two of our founding executives. I myself grew up in New Hampshire, was born and raised in Newbury, New Hampshire, and I gained my appreciation for the natural environment, hiking and skiing with my family in the New Hampshire mountains. My parents still live in my childhood home in Newbury, and I spend many weekends there with my husband and my two young children. Before joining New Leaf, I spent the last decade working at the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities as the Distributed Generation and Clean Energy Ombudsperson and Chief of Staff. During my time there, I was able to work with the distributed generation industry, government agencies, and the electric utilities to improve the interconnection rules in Massachusetts and see firsthand the impact an efficient set of interconnection standards can have on a state's economy and its residents. New Leaf operates in over 15 states across the country, and one of the key factors that we consider in deciding where to invest 
is whether a state has a clear set of interconnection standards to ensure a predictable process, timelines, and costs, as well as opportunities for dispute resolution and process improvement. While New Leaf is active in New Hampshire and we have three projects in the interconnection queue, we are extremely limited in our ability to move fo projects forward due to the lack of access to information and regulatory certainty of timelines and costs. We're eager to invest more and to grow our business in New Hampshire, but we're forced to focus our attention and resources in other states where there's a set of rules that both we and the electric utilities can follow to ensure an efficient interconnection process. Senate Bill 391 appears on its face to be an obscure piece of technical legislation, but its impact is actually simple. Without this bill, it will not be possible for distributed generation companies to continue doing business in New Hampshire or for New Hampshire residents and businesses to make their own energy choices. A lack of clear rules of the road leaves New Leaf and other companies in limbo with no way to predict when our projects may be able to come online. There are many facets of project development and construction that make an extended lead time unfinanceable. Project considerations such as site control, permitting, and revenue agreements require a considerable amount of capital and resources to maintain, and they also have finite terms that are subject to expiration. For that reason, distributed generation companies are hesitant to expend time and resources on a project with uncertain viability and where other opportunities exist with less risk and variability. So for these reasons, I urge you to support Senate Bill 391 because without it, New Hampshire will foreclose an opportunity to strengthen its energy security and New Hampshire residents and businesses will be unable to make the energy choices that are best for them. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today and for considering this critical legislation. Thank you for being here. Apologies again for mispronouncing your last name. <laughs> Could you tell us, are you happy with Senate Bill 391 as written? Yes, I think it's the key and most important thing here is for us to move forward with implementing a set of interconnection rules and standards. Um, whether that's done by DOE or at the PUC, I think we need to move forward with getting those standards in place and to have stakeholder engagement and establishment. Okay, great. Representative McGee has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Tomei, for taking my question. Um, when I look at the bill as written in front of me, uh, starting on line seven, uh, the sentence starts, the draft rules shall include detailed applicability and eligibility requirements in provisions relating to engineering standards, review processes, timelines, cost responsibilities, information sharing and transparency, and dispute resolution that are aligned with national best practices, including the IREC, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council's 2023 model interconnection procedures. In your experience, is that definition adequate for our regulators to be able to um, pull together a process? Because I don't know how much you know about the IP 202201 report that came out on December 5th that was the result of SB 262 in 2022, which many of us participated in. Um, so we've been trying to sort of get some recommendations for a while. Do you think that this language um, is sufficient instruction? Because it sounds like we have a, a pending amendment that has some very specific uh, try, trying to sort of jump to the solution rather than have a process. Do, do you think this will get us there? I do think that that language is sufficient to get us there, um, although I do recognize what the other constituent said earlier today about um, the, for smaller facilities, the potential of a differing process. In Massachusetts, there are three different tracks that are followed uh -huh. for interconnection, and there's a simplified process that's utilized for smaller facilities. Um, I am familiar with the process that was undergone prior to this and participated in it, and I know that there was discussion about looking at both the interconnection rules in Massachusetts as well as the IREC model rules in considering what should be implemented in New Hampshire. So I think based on the language that's included in the legislation, um, the process or investigation to set those standards would give an opportunity to consider those separate tracks for interconnection. And I have a follow-up. Sure. 
follow up. And so the other part of the process seems to be that um, we took out a timeline for turning around um, these rules based on an objection from our largest utility, I believe, who also does business in Massachusetts. So are they currently privy to, or are they currently required to uh, abide by the rules that have been adopted in our neighboring state? Yes. They, they, so they already are, are functioning in another state with those, uh, with rules. Yes, absolutely. Massachusetts has an interconnection tariff, and in that tariff, there are timeline requirements for the interconnection process for all three of the processes, that th all three of the tracks mm -hmm. included, and Eversource as one of the Massachusetts electric utilities is required to follow the interconnection tariff. Okay, thank you. Representative Lewicki has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. I see in the bill it says that uh, any new employee positions required to implement this chapter shall be approved by the Fiscal Committee of the General Court, um, which implies that there should be a fiscal note here because this is going to be costing the taxpayers money. I also question how much is this going to cost the utility companies? How many trucks, how many employees are they going to be need to clear the backlog and to do all these interconnections? Because these are costs that uh, will be borne not by the people who are being interconnected, but by the utility company. Um, I, there may be others here who are better suited to answer that question, but I can tell you in my personal opinion, there are already there's already an interconnection process for each of the utilities in New Hampshire, but it's at the utility's discretion, and so it doesn't have a set timeline or regulatory certainty for timelines, cost, and process for both the customer and the utilities. So the utilities have discretion, and um, this discretion is not being followed uniformly. So having a process in place that's followed, in my opinion, shouldn't incur significant additional costs to what's already occurring in the state. Representative Thomas has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you for taking my question. Based on earlier discussions, are you concerned about um, the apparent lack of timelines and guardrails on the original bill? Yes, I, I, it would be my preference to have um, a set timeline for implementation of the interconnection process. Representative Reynolds has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it sounds like you're, based on your former position in Massachusetts, you are ideally positioned perhaps to answer this question. What do you think would be a reasonable, given given the fact that our neighboring state and has these standards already in place and our largest utility also operates in Massachusetts, what would be a reasonable timeline for New Hampshire our Department of Energy to develop to, to run this process, and given the fact that they already did an investig investigatory proceeding and got a lot of stakeholder input, what would be a reasonable amount of time to give our Department of Energy to publish these interconnection standards and put them in place? Sure. I, I will months? certainly offer my opinion. I do recognize that having worked at the Department of Public Utilities in Massachusetts, there's, of course, um, lack of staff and bandwidth that could constrain the Department of Energy. But I think that six months would be a reasonable time considering there's already been an investigation. There are model rules that are offered. And we also have Massachusetts, the neighboring state that has a set of rules that are um, efficient. Okay, seeing no additional questions, I want to thank you for being here. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much. Next up is Rick Labreck, representing now Agilitas Energy. We'd like to welcome Mr. Labreck back. He used to testify before this committee in years gone by on behalf of Eversource Energy. Welcome, Mr. Labreck. Thank nice you for that. You. Welcome. It's great to be back. Um, uh, Mr. Chair and all the members, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to speak. My name is Rick Labreck. I'm currently the Director of Interconnection and Utility Affairs for Agilitas Energy, which is a small but growing solar and battery storage company located in Wakefield, Massachusetts. We own and operate large net metering facilities in Milton, New Hampshire, Dover, New Hampshire, and a small project in Keene, New Hampshire. We are 
actively engaged in early development at uh, numerous sites in New Hampshire, but as uh, Kate Tomei just spoke to, it, it is a challenging environment here given the lack of rules. Um, I want to clarify one thing about the bill in case it caused any kind of confusion where it says the PUC Rule 900, uh, I'm going to switch to my other glasses, sorry. Uh, PUC Rule 900 shall remain uh, in effect until any rules adopted pursuant to this section become effective. PUC 90102A clarifies that PUC 904 through 908 are only applicable to small customer generators. And those are the sections of the 900 rules that relate to interconnection. So the 900 rules only have in it interconnection process and procedures for 100 kW and smaller facilities. PUC 901.02D states interconnection of large net metering customer generators, which is anything over 100 kilowatts, shall be governed by each utility's interconnection practices as set forth in its tariff filed with the commission. The PSNH Eversource's tariff filed with the commission has a section 37 that doesn't say much of anything. The only thing of, of relevance it says is for all other generating facilities, meaning those that aren't smaller than 100, the company must be contacted for site-specific interconnection requirements prior to interconnecting the generating facility with the company's facility. Now, the company does have Distributed Generator Interconnection Guidelines dated July 2019 on its website. And I know because in my, I should have mentioned prior to working at Agilitas, I spent 30 years working at Eversource. This is probably a key point. And I spent the last 12 years as the manager of the group that interconnects distributed generation. So I wrote those guidelines. The guidelines that are on the website, I wrote almost um, single-handedly, you know, on a Sunday morning in my living room. I copied the Connecticut rules that were part of a, 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 a Pura uh, proceeding in like 2015 that Eversource's Connecticut affiliate had to live with. I said, well, I might as well make them close to my affiliate in Connecticut's rules as possible. But I tailored them somewhat by taking out the elements that I thought were a little overkill, were a little uh, uh, unnecessary, ad administratively burdensome to Eversource. And I took out the vast majority of timelines that applied to Eversource. But I left in the rules the timelines that applied to developers. You know, you shall have 20 days to sign this and return it. You'll have 30 days to send us a 25% deposit things like that. So there are guidelines on their website. They were emailed to staff members of the PUC in, I don't know, 2019, let's say 2020, but they were never officially filed with the PUC commission or subject of a, of a proceeding of any kind. So I just wanted to clarify that to the extent anyone believes there's not an urgency here because PUC 900 already has rules there are not rules in PUC 900. There's a document on Eversource's website um, that is, from my perspective now as a developer, um, woefully inadequate to control the process. The process is much more uh, important now that the volume of interconnection applications has grown. The system is being stressed. And, and rules become much more important. Why do we need rules? They provide a framework to control the orderly process. Both the applicant and the utility have responsibilities for an efficient process. The rules create performance standards for the utilities and ideally would also contain data reporting requirements so that all stakeholders are kept up to date about adherence 
to performance standards, specifically timelines for getting work completed. Transparency is critical. Data must be made available to identify weak points and focus resources on improving those aspects of the process. Massachusetts has an amazing set of rules, some very strict timelines. Kate to May could, could come back up and, and testify further on those. There's even a very specific timeline enforcement mechanism in Massachusetts. And miraculously, Eversource Mass, I don't believe has ever failed a timeline, even though if you talk to developers in Mass, it's a nightmare, 10x what it is in New Hampshire. So be on guard that there are ways, even with rules, to make them ineffective. So we have to make sure they have some teeth. Without rules, disputes devolve into finger pointing and second guessing. The DER developers are in a very weak position to challenge any aspect of utility performance. The utilities have almost complete control and can slow walk or even ignore disagreements. The most frustrating aspect of interconnection as you've heard this morning from a few folks, is the inability to get questions resolved and complaints addressed. Based on my time with Eversource, I wanna make it clear that the reasons for this are the lack of firm regulatory rules that contain enforceable performance metrics, and also the general lack of priority given within utilities, I'll speak for Eversource, to the DE, Eversource during my time there, to the DER interconnection function. Employees that work in this area are very hardworking, professional, and dedicated to strong performance. However, keep in mind that DER interconnection is a nonprofit segment of the utility organization. It is understandable that utility executives, not the workers doing the hard work, but the utility executives do not devote significant effort or resources or strategic thinking into improving this function. While not the subject of Senate Bill 391, I believe interconnection rules should involve either penalties for non-performance or better incentives to the utility for strong performance. Given a profit motivation, the utilities will find a way to expedite interconnections. A perfect example is Eversource's world-class energy efficiency organization that operates with a shareholder incentive mechanism for their performance. Regarding Senate Bill 391, the lack of a deadline I, in the, for a rulemaking is disappointing. I, I think it, personally, um, with all due respect, I think it looks bad that it doesn't have a timeline. I think it hints at something nefarious. I hate to be a conspiracy theorist, but I don't even know if SB 391 is needed as written. Uh, the DOE could create a rulemaking now. They could open a docket for rulemaking, or they could not. I believe they have the authority. The PUC has the authority. So I don't know what SB 391 is doing other than saying, open the proceeding within 60 days. I think it needs a deadline. The DOE has already had an investigatory proceeding, IP 2022-01. They've collected a wide range of stakeholder input. There was general consensus on the need for rules and standards. These rules are needed quickly, and they must be rules with teeth. And the agency that enforces the rules needs to get engaged and ensure rule compliance and to resolve disputes, large and small. Thank you. And Could you provide us with uh, any written testimony? I could uh, clean this up and, and, and give this to you. It's basically what I, I essentially just read what I will send you, if that's okay. That would be fine. Okay. We'd appreciate that. And I'm sure Representative Reynolds is going to want to know what you think would be a reasonable deadline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But actually, that, that wasn't the... the the question I was going to ask, um, having asked that previously, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Lebrecht, for being here. And um, again, of course, you would uh, tell us 
uh, tell us all uh, that you, you know, 30 years uh, at Eversource, including the, as you said, the last 12 overseeing the group that that handled the interconnection process. And uh, uh, I, I want to kind of ask some question, a, a question here, if the chairman, if you'll indulge me, just I hope to illuminate a little bit. This is a very complex topic that we're discussing, trying to require DOE to publish rules for. So I wanted to try to um, illustrate it here for everyone's benefit. Um, and so while we're disclosing, I, before joining the legislature, um, I spent three and a half years uh, uh, with Revision Energy uh, selling commercial solar projects, trying to sell commercial solar projects. And so this interconnection- We, we are familiar with your background. Yes. Could you just ask your question, yes. please? Yeah, the interconnection process, the, the big bugaboo. It, would you, what we're talking about when once a developer submits a interconnection application, uh, is getting that thing called the system impact study done. And as you described, uh, interestingly, the way you wrote Eversource's guidelines um, for such, uh, you, um, you, you took out the timelines the applicable to the utility <laughs> while leaving them for the developers. Uh, would you agree that it, with respect to the system impact study, the things that are ch most challenging now that you sit on the other side as a developer is one, the lack of any standards for the time that the utility has to conduct that study. Um, the electrical, the, the clarity of the electrical engineering standards that apply to that study as as they indicate the need or lack uh, the need for any and the level of system upgrades upgrades to the grid in order for this um, solar generation facility to connect and then finally the cost of any such upgrades that the utility ultimately determines are required. So like those three elements, the time it takes, what the engineering standards are, and the cost. Uh, my recollection was from the developer's standpoint, it was like you applied for interconnection, you kind of threw that over the wall, the utility took it, had it, sat it, did it all itself, and you waited. And maybe that study came back within a year and it said, okay, you can interconnect, but you're going to have to upgrade this, 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 and this, and it's going to cost this, 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 and this. And then that would just put the project totally over the edge in terms of economic viability. Is that what, what we're talking about here in this interconnections, you know, this? Yeah, that's, that's basically the All process. Right. Yes. Appreciate the brevity of that answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Seeing no further questions from the committee, I want to thank you, Mr. Lebrec, and I would appreciate some written testimony from you. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see Representative McWilliams had her hand up. Thank you, Chair Bose. Um, I, I just want to ask a little bit more um, about, you mentioned incentives, uh, both on the Eversource side and potentially on the developer side for speed schedule. Um, my background's in construction. I'm very familiar with damages for delay and also mm. clauses that would provide an incentive for speedy um, completion on a timeline. Um, do you have any experience with other states or other are there situations where these have been applied, either damages or incentives uh, for developer or utility? Because I think that that's something worth exploring. I think on the developer side, the the damage is you know being removed from the queue. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, you're typically uh, removed from the process. You have to start over. Um, I can't say that I'm aware of a utility or a franchise area that says if the utility interconnects you within X days, you get X amount of. <laughs> shareholder incentives. Certainly such a process could be devised. I believe energy efficiency is somehow earns an incentive based on the amount of capital they deploy of energy efficiency measures. 
there could be something devised. Um, what we have seen uh, more uh, often is a concept whereby the utilities, with all the interconnection required to put distributed generation, there's a lot of facilities that need to be built. Circuits need to be upgraded. Sometimes in the extreme, substations need to be upgraded. Uh, protection and control equipment needs to be upgraded. And right now, the distributed generators in most franchise areas, the rules say you pay for 100%. Even if you've built a brand, you know, if you've funded a brand new $5 million transformer at a substation, say, um, you could create rules. It would be have to be in law that say uh, maybe the developer pays a percentage of that based on some engineering technical metrics, but a percentage of that $5 million investment has long-term benefits to Eversource's customer as a whole. And therefore, that should be treated more like traditional utility investment for which the utilities earn a profit. That would speed them up as well. If they thought for every million dollars worth of DG-related infrastructure upgrades we deploy over the next, you know, decades. Uh, we're going to get a small chunk. It's going to it's going to grease the skids and get things moving. So there, there's a pr provisional process like that in Massachusetts and and elsewhere. They're looking into things like that. Thank you very much. Okay, I want to thank you for being here, and that's very thank illuminating you. testimony you provided. Next, we'll hear from Rockingham County Commissioner Brian Chiricello, the Honorable Brian Chiricello. Welcome back. Good to see you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. For the record, my name is Brian Chiricello. I'm the chairman of Rockingham County Commissioners, second largest county in the state. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick background as to what Rockingham County is doing and the issue that we had. Um, so Rockingham County, and in, in, uh, during COVID times, we received some federal dollars from the federal government. And um, that's allowing us to build a $77 million building to house my um, sheriff's department, um, registry of deeds, and my county attorney's office. And at the time, um, we had a building committee that was looking at doing some solar arrays that would be on top of covered parking. Um, once we received that ARPA money, we decided that it would be better used if we could do um, an actual solar array. And so that's the approach that we took. And bear with me one second. My eyes are not that, that well, but... Um, so we submitted an application um, to interconnect a 3.25 megawatt AC project, 8,800 panels total. And there was some talk about businesses doing smaller, uh, smaller. Um, and I realize this is a little bit bigger, but, uh, but it's still important. Um, so in November 2022, we received a system impact study agreement in May of 2023. Six months later, the utility confirmed the study would begin on June 14th. We were told the study had a set timeline of 80 business days, which our developer, um, the people that are doing our building, are also um, working with the solar piece, um, that it, um, it had slipped through the cracks. We were told it was on course. And the developer was told that they were working on it, and then after 80 days, we were told, quote, unquote, slipped through the cracks, and the study process had not, in fact, not begun. This was immensely challenging news to receive as the project had otherwise already been fully permitted and we have already committed to specific project deadlines, which became entirely out of reach. Why is that important? We're using opera money. So if you're familiar with opera money, it, you've got you've to allocate it by a certain time and then you've got to spend it. So any delays would jeopardize um, federal dollars being able to use for the for the solar arrays, um, I had heard one of the representatives mention talk about the ratepayers, um, and I realized that businesses were talking about solar, but now we're talking about um, government entities. And one of the things that we're doing is the the 
the investment for the solar array in Rockingham County over the lifespan of 30 years would return to the, to the ratepayers of Rockingham County $22.5 million. So this, is, this covers all of the Rockingham County complex's electricity. Our bill typically is around $600,000 a year, between six hundred dollars and $700,000 a year. So it's significant. Um, but without any rules, it's, it's tough. Um, and having rules set would, would have made it a lot easier for us, you know, to be told that everything was on, on par uh, and then to find out after the fact it was not uh, is problematic. So we're behind the eight ball a little bit. I mean, it's, I think we're still, we can still manage it, but I, I think that rules need to be in place. So you've heard all the testimony here. Um, and I think uh, that this story needed to be told because it's not just businesses, it's also um, municipalities. Um, also, really briefly, I also wear a second hat. I'm a town councilor in Derry. And in Derry, we did a PPA uh, smaller array, but same same thing, um, and that would have lowered our kilowatt um, cost to six cents per kilowatt. We had the same problem at the town of Derry, um, lack of communication and no no set rules. So this needs to get fixed. So um, I'll end it there, and I'm happy to take any questions that anyone may have. Okay, thank you. Seeing no questions from the committee, we'll move along and I'll call next on Sam Evans Brown of Clean Energy New Hampshire to give the committee his perspective on this legislation. Welcome back, Mr. Evans Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, <clears throat> I'll try to be brief. Uh, many of the points that, that uh, our members and our organization might make have been made already. But I will say that, in my opinion, this is actually the biggest problem confronting the energy sector as 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 it you know in 2024. Um, these interconnection delays, you know, pick your generation type. They impact every type of electrical generator. It just happens that what we're building right now is a lot of renewables, and so that's why you're hearing about solar a lot today. Um, when I joined this organization three years ago. This was the issue that I was pulled aside and talked to about before I even was on the payroll. So this has been stewing for quite a while. We attempted to solve this in 2022 with the passage of H, uh, SB 262, passed on a bipartisan basis. Um, this bill initially was intended to be a placeholder for recommendations that would come out of the DOE's interconnection investigation. Um, and frankly, we were somewhat underwhelmed by the results of that investigation. And so we said, instead, maybe we should ask the, the department to simply go right ahead and start on rulemaking. Um, stories like the ones you have heard are in my inbox every week. Um, some that you maybe would be interested to know about, uh, the, the Glen House, the hotel at the base of Mount Washington has been waiting for a year for an interconnection study. They've had to delay their project for an entire year. Town of Whitefield, which is one of the smallest, uh, lowest income towns in the state, one of the top 25 lowest income towns in the state, purchased, uh, they received a USDA grant to put solar on the roof of their town buildings. Uh, the town hall had their array installed in November, and as of last week, they were still waiting for permission to turn that array on. Um, so, so as I said, these stories are quite prevalent. Um, I would say I've heard some things that I, I just want to address. Um, developers already are paying the interconnection costs, so the idea that this is going to result in cost shift to customers that aren't benefiting from, from the arrays, I think, is something that we can just put to rest. That's not the case. Developers are paying these costs. Um, however, I would hesitate to put into statute a requirement that developers pay for all costs. Um, there's quite a lot to be worked out in the question of cost allocation for interconnection costs, and in particular uh, in Eversource territory, there are interconnection upgrades that are being required that it's not clear how necessary they actually are. Uh, in fact, those types of upgrades are often not required in service territories of other utilities. And 
rate payers that are not benefic- that are not uh, th- uh, paying for the the array and benefiting from the array are benefiting from those upgrades. And so an example, uh, the classic one that I like to give is this idea of reclosers. So developers are asked to be paid are at being asked to pay for the upgrades to multiple reclosers on on circuits. Uh, what a recloser is is essentially a circuit breaker that's SCADA controlled circuit breaker that can be operated from a control room. Uh, when you swap out a fuse for for a, a recloser, all ratepayers benefit from that because instead of having to roll a truck to handle an outage, you can just hit a button and test to see if the recloser can reclose. So this question of cost allocation is there's a lot of thorny issues in there, and I don't think that there should be it should be in statute that um, that 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 the developer shall always and forever pay for all of those upgrades. I think that should be worked out in the working groups that were recommended in the DOE investigation. Um, I, one one other note, you know, we have heard that uh, interconnection queues are are incredibly jammed up right now. I actually think that having rules and certainty would help with that problem because uh, you know there are the. That there are plenty of actors in the space. It is not just the utilities that are part of the problem here too. Developers can be part of the problem. And one of the things that, one of the behaviors that is somewhat problematic is that if you are a developer trying to build a project, you one of the first things you do is you pitch that project into the interconnection queue because you know it's gonna take perhaps a year or 18 months to get your study back. And so the so you're so there are sometimes speculative projects that are being put into these queues that are that are clogging them up. And if we had certainty timelines uh, that uh, I think there would be fewer of those speculative projects and we would have less gumming up of the works. Um, uh, I also concur that I think the deadlines should be reintroduced uh, in an amendment. Um, and I think uh, that we need to, to get some clarity in terms of administrative processes. One, one concern I have going forward is that uh, as initially proposed, this bill had the rulemaking at the Public Utilities Commission, which has fairly clearly defined administrative rules and processes that have been in, exist for, in existence for decades. Um, the Department of Energy, while uh, doing a great job getting up and running, is a still somewhat new entity. Uh, and and I, uh, I, I'm hesitant uh, to, see them, to see them owning this rulemaking entirely. I would prefer to see the Department of Energy draft the initial rules and then have the proceeding uh, undertaken at the Public Utilities Commission. And so with that, I'll end my comments. Thank you. Appreciate that. Representative um, Munns has a question. Sorry, Chris. I thank, thank threw you, a Mr. blank on your name for a minute. <laughs> I don't know what that says. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it says I haven't seen you in a while. Yes, and my apologies to the uh, committee for my, uh, my lack of uh, attention this morning. Um, and um, uh, my apologies if this question has already been asked, but uh, I wanted to ask somebody, so I picked on you. Um, the, um, the language um, talks about, um, and it's in uh, line six, it talks about New Hampshire's investor-owned utilities. Um, does that include the co-op? Is the co-op part of, part of this? It does not. So this does not include the co-op. The co-op is not subject to PUC regulation. So uh, the, the, the co-op would not be roped into this. Follow-up? Go ahead. So does the do customers of the, of the co-op experience the same difficulties? Um, that's uh, that's an excellent question, and I would happily sort of go back to go back to my emails and try to determine uh, determine the degree to which co-op customers are experiencing these problems. Um, but I actually wouldn't I wouldn't be able to say with great certainty uh, how these problems are distributed utility by utility with here on the stand on the spot. Representative Mick Williams has a question. Thank you, Chair Bose. Um, and thank you, Mr. Evans Brown, for testifying. Uh, my question would be from a reasonableness perspective. What do you think is a reasonable schedule um, if we were to break this down into something that could be feasible? Uh, following up on my previous question about pain share, gain share, penalties for delay versus incentives for completion on time, what is a reasonable schedule, in your opinion? Uh, I would encourage you to ask that question to the Department of Energy, for for one. I personally think the that the idea that we could have at least um, you know a proceeding open and going by by midsummer is is not out of the question, um, which I would argue would mean that we could have rules on the books by the end of the year. But uh, 
uh, I am not the Department of Energy. Um, I would I will look forward to working collaboratively with them to make the rulemaking process as smooth as possible. But uh, it'll be their staff that has to run it. Follow up. <clears throat> yes, follow up. Uh, thank you for that in terms of the legislation. I, I think to clarify, my schedule question is really about how long should it take from a developer submitting an application to doing the utility analysis to actually being able to install and then to connect in terms of schedule? Uh, again, I'd, I'd, I'd hesitate to shoot from the hip here on the stand. I mean, I, I think that uh, certain steps, uh, a 10 day requirement is is certainly reasonable. So you pitch in an application, getting a response in 10 days, I think is is something that, that um, should be on the books. The question of what is the timeline for things like a system interconnection study? Um, I would imagine that, that that'll be a question that's heavily uh, contested in the process of creating creating the rules. And so um, I would want to uh, confer with our members to, to see what other states are doing before before trying to, to answer it on the stand. But uh, as things stand now, it's untenable. Uh, you, there's, you have no idea how long these studies will take, and they're often over a year with, with simply radio silence as to when your system interconnection study might be completed. Thank you for that. Representative Lewicki has a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. You mentioned uh, speculative applications coming up the works, and it may already be the case that there is an application fee. But if there is not, would you be in favor of an application fee that would uh, be forfeited if uh, a, an application were withdrawn? Uh, I think I think yes is the answer. There is already an application fee, but I, I think that actually could be helpful. Okay, we have three more. Representative Partial. Thank you, Chair, and thank you again for taking my question. Um, it was some point out earlier that the this um, legislation as written doesn't do much that cannot already be done uh, internally in the DOE. Uh, would you be in favor of some type of uh, teeth such as a deadline added to the spills as amended? Uh, yes, I would be in favor of a deadline, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, we have four more people who would like to testify, so I want to thank you, Mr. Evans-Brown, for being here, and I'd like to call next on Dan Yar No, I believe it is, or I may be wrong about that, but Dan, you can um, clarify that when you get in uh, in the chair. Thank you, and it's welcome. Yarrington, like Harrington, but with a Y. Or you can say Yarrington if you prefer uh, the pirate pronunciation. Oh, okay. So like Representative Harrington. <clears throat> Um, it doesn't look like there's enough. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, I'm just here representing, unlike uh, the folks who are representing utilities and other things and uh, solar companies, I'm just representing myself and my family here. So thank you very much. You should each have a copy of this I printed out and gave to you. Um, this is just on behalf of myself, my wife, Sarah, and our three kids, Logan, Malcolm, and Owen. We live in London, New Hampshire. Um, we are fortunate enough to have a very nice house that we can put solar on, and we invested in that over the years. Um, the gist of my testimony, and you can read through this at your leisure, so I'll try and keep it brief, is we've done a several arrays. We did one small array when we started, and then we added them recently. So the perspective that I'm giving here is, in the past, it was a lot easier. And something's happened in the last like five, six years that's made it a lot harder. And we should not have to stand for this kind of bureaucracy when we decide we want to invest in something. These are very basic things. I mean, we're obviously not talking about over 100 megawatts. We're well under that for our home. But this does affect homeowners and just residents in addition to businesses. I'm, uh, I, I have my own business as well, so I'm very um, understanding of the challenges there. But this affects families if we say we want to, it's the same challenge. We want to invest in our solar. We want to invest in stable energy so that we can help ourselves and our neighbors help stabilize the grid, uh, which is better for everybody. Uh, that's the gist of my testimony here is that it's taken way too long. In our case, it was about four or five months. We lost an entire kind of prime summer, uh, you know, generation season. And um, you can read all the details in my testimony here. I kept it short, but I shouldn't have to send 100 emails and make dozens of phone calls to get this done. We didn't have to in the past, and it's gotten worse as this has developed, I assume based on the volume of, you know, new development. So... Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Like I said, you're welcome to read this over uh, at your leisure. But um, this this phrase here uh, is really key. We moved, my family here moved to New Hampshire in 2003. So we've been here 20 years now. 
And we relish our ability to live free. We want to be free of outdated and onerous regulations, free of sticky red tape, and free of overly complex barriers to the responsible exercise of our personal property rights. If we choose to invest in solar, we want that to be a reasonable process. So whatever we can do towards that end, that's our goal. Okay, thank you very much. Representative Corman needs to ask you a question though. Sure. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, so I just want to clarify, you're talking about relatively small residential and that yep. it took you several months and with which utility? Uh, this is with Eversource, is our local utility. And um, we had done several arrays in the past, small arrays, I think our total, it was like 10, Mega, uh, 10 kilowatts, I guess. I think our total is like 38. We, But we've done this over many years and we've worked with uh, the same company each time to do the install. So I don't think the issue's there. I think there's just, you know, something wrong in the system. Uh, much wiser heads than I have testified it here today. And I just want to provide the uh, perspective that this does affect just everyday, day-to-day -day rate payers. You know, that's a whole bunch of money that's just sitting on my roof that I don't get to recoup. And that's very frustrating. So it does make a difference. This isn't rocket science. It's some kind of science, but it's not rocket science. We should be able to have rules and they should be simple and clear and be able to move these things forward quickly. Thank you, Mr. Yarrington. Okay, Representative McWilliams, do you have to ask a question? Really quick. Okay. Um, considering your position is as an individual and it's for residential solar, do you believe there should be two different tracks for smaller versus larger array installation and timelines? Uh, it sounds like there may already be that, and I'm not as familiar with all the current rules and regulations, but that makes sense to me that there's, you know, up to 100, under 100, whatever that is, um, uh, whatever is reasonable. And like I said, it just has to be a firm process. Like my day job is I make board games. We know about writing clear rules and there's nothing more frustrating than like, this is what the rules say, or if the rules just don't say anything. And if I say, this is the rules, you need to follow the damn rules. Like that's what the rules are there for. So it sounds like we have a mess of a rule book here and we need to make a better rule book. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Yarrington. Appreciate your testimony here this morning. Thank you all. Next, I'd like to call on Lindsay Burgoyne of Revision Energy and Ms. Burgoyne, I'd like you to uh, keep your uh, testimony as brief as possible. We need to get out of here. Um, this hearing has gone on quite long, so we understand the issue. So just give us any new information that you have that can make it easier for us to figure out what to do. Sure. Thank you, Chairman. Good to see you all. Uh, my name is Lindsay Burgoyne. I serve as the Director of Policy and Government Affairs for Revision Energy. Um, we've been installing interconnecting solar in the state since 2009, and dare I say may have, um, we suspect we may have filed and interconnected more systems in the state than perhaps anyone else. So um, I am actually not going to speak on the policy topic today and instead um, turn it over to my colleague, Megan Ullen, who's here to speak a little bit about her experience in the field um, submitting these applications. And we will keep that brief. Um, and then my written comments co cover more of our policy talking points. Okay, so we understand that there are delays in the process. We get that. We've heard it multiple times. So you don't need to repeat that message. Just give us information that we can use to figure out a solution. Thank you. Understood. Uh, my name is Megan Ulan. I serve as a project developer for Revision Energy, where I have worked in Brentwood for the past eight and a half years. I've held roles where I was responsible for filing and managing interconnection applications for residential, commercial, and municipal customers, and overseeing the development of around 200 projects a year. Today, I manage the interconnection process for commercial and municipal projects, 50 kW to 5 megawatts EC. Oh, apologies. Um, I guess my testimony today is to illustrate a couple of examples. I can expound upon what uh, Mr. Yarrington provided for the residential customers. Um, the lack of comprehensive interconnection rules has been readily apparent throughout my work. Residential customers are waiting months to turn on their systems, creating challenges when they are required to make loan payments and pay electricity bills while the system sits idle on their roof. Recently in Eversource territory, customers experienced an average timeline of 17 to 18 business days from submission of closeout documentation to permission to operate with times where it spiked to over 40 days. So imagine installing a solar system and then being told you must wait nearly eight weeks to turn, turn it on. This makes it incredibly difficult to give customers realistic expectations. Eversource significantly improved residential timelines with new software. And while we appreciate those efforts, our state's utility customers deserve, as you have heard, equal accountabilities across all utilities for all project sizes and with the assurance that the processes won't change and dispute resolution is available should things go wrong. For larger customers, the lack of rules, 
means they are waiting months or even years to be able to determine whether the project can safely interconnect. A few examples that we wanted to provide to you today illustrate this. Um, in 2022, a key nonprofit applied for an interconnection of a 260 KWAC project, received their system impact study agreement, and then their interconnection agreement by April 2023, total of five months. More recently, a Manchester business applied for a project half that size in June of 2023. And we were told just this past month that the system impact study won't begin until April 2025, which is 23 months later and doesn't include the timeline for the study itself which typically takes four to six months, making this a 27 to 29 month timeline. This is not a one-time occurrence. Timelines for these projects above 100 KWAC have recently increased exponentially. And these study start estimates are on average 22 to 26 months after the application date. Uh, I think what is new information here is that this is um, not just on the front end, we experience these delays on the closeout side as well. We have a 160 KWAC municipal project in Rochester. We submitted its closeout documentation in mid-December, and we have spent the past three months inquiring when the customer will receive their net meter swap and permission to operate to no avail. So we can't give the city any expectations of when they'll be able to operate their system. I think for those reasons, um, we do seek a rulemaking at the PUC. We think that will meet the goals of SB 262 in terms of providing timely, cost-effective, and predictable interconnection standards. Um, there are really great, robust uh, model interconnection procedures out there from both FERC and IREC um, that can be utilized, which means New Hampshire doesn't have to start from scratch and can customize those and build upon a DOE's investigation. Um, we agree with the, the comments on timelines. Um, and in fact, uh, the model interconnection procedures of, of both entities um, outline, you know, different different types of project size, level one through four. I think those have been renamed um, recently, but what are appropriate timelines for um, folks hearing back from utilities for each of those size um, uh, kind of categories, if you will. So thank you. Great. Thank you. We appreciate you guys being here. All right. Representative Kaplan has a question for you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Uh, this is probably for Ms. Burgoyne. Um, and you do call for the for this rulemaking to be carried out at the PUC, and the and the the the, uh, the legislation we have is is calling for that to be carried out at the Department of Energy. So can you just elaborate on what you think the difference between those two bodies would be in terms of the rulemaking? Yes, um, for sure. And I think, as you may note, the original legislation did include um, the PUC being the authoritative body in that regard. I think it's the, the PUC's role to regulate utilities, and this really is utility regulation um, in terms of interconnection. So we think that's the most appropriate body. We think it would be great for DOE to build upon the investigation that they did and draft a rule and then submit it to the PUC for the rulemaking um, to ensure a, a process in which we can all engage. Thanks. Okay, seeing no further questions, we've got two uh, folks to go. Both probably have significant things to say to us. So we'll hear first from Michael Lakata of Eversource, and then we'll follow that up with Josh Elliott from the Department of Energy. Good afternoon, uh, Michael Licata, representing Eversource Energy. Appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today and uh, provide uh, a little bit of the utility perspective um, and our experience with uh, DER interconnection uh, process. Uh, first and foremost, I, I wanna make it clear that Eversource supports the development of a statewide DER interconnection standard. Uh, that was our testimony in the Senate. We've been consistent uh, with that position throughout. We fully engaged in the uh, DOE investigation that's been referenced several times uh, and uh, would continue to engage uh, in the stakeholder um, working group process uh, discussed as part of uh, the final report on that investigation. Over the past several years, um, we have seen exponential growth in the number of solar applications that Eversource has received, although I think it's it's pretty consistent with the other utilities as well, based upon our conversations with them. Uh, to put it in perspective, in the year 2000, we received about 1,000 uh, interconnection requests. That went up to 1,500 in 2021. Uh, in 2022, 4,300. 2023, 
uh, 4,700, and we're expecting this year uh, over 5,000 interconnection applications. Uh, that's a 337% increase. Um, that surge, uh, which coincided uh, with uh, around the time of the pandemic, um, uh, did result in, in significant delays, has resulted in significant delays, and we have taken uh, considerable steps to address those delays. Uh, we responded by uh, changing our process, focusing first on uh, smaller applications, um, the typical residential solar interconnection. Uh, we've implemented a fast track program for these smaller interconnections where there is a, a quick review, not a full engineering uh, review. We've separated them out from, from the larger projects that are more uh, complex and take more time. Uh, in addition, we have implemented uh, new uh, software management program, Power Clerk, uh, which allows an efficient review and automatic approval of some projects. And because of, of those uh, changes and process improvements, today we are processing new applications, I'm sorry, 95% of new applications for solar interconnection within three days, which I understand is significantly different from the testimony that you heard here today. Uh, but the vast majority of Eversource customers are receiving a, an initial turnaround within three days. It is on average about 45 um, days after that for the installer to complete the installation. And then the project is online within uh, uh, 46 to, to 48 days. That's the average uh, across for solar installations. That said, we understand that there is more work and considerable more work to be done to improve this process. In particular, uh, larger projects, over 100 kW, uh, the process to uh, evaluate and address those programs, uh, we are in the process of continuing improvement. Uh, and I just want to pause here for a second. Um, to be clear, we do not oppose uh, a statewide rulemaking uh, to set standards, but we are not waiting for that rulemaking. We're not waiting for uh, the results of an investigation. We are actively incorporating uh, meeting with developers and incorporating their feedback on process improvements um, to make sure that we are, are turning things around as quickly as possible while still acting as a responsible utility protecting the safety and reliability of our system. Um, larger projects, which have mostly been the, the focus of discussion today, uh, do require, uh, uh, in some cases, significant uh, engineering review, uh, can have significant impacts on the electric system, and require project uh, impact studies. Uh, one of the um, reforms that we put into place with our project in June of last year was an initial feasibility review process. So this is a, a high level look um, at a, a large solar uh, interconnection application and initial feedback that we can provide to a developer that says, this is gonna be really expensive or this would not be really expensive and they may be, uh, make the determination to proceed with, with the project. A lot of the projects that we have in our queue um, are very dynamic. Uh, some of them are very mature projects. Some of them are candidly conceptual projects. And the developer is sort of taking the utility temperature on whether there is a significant interconnection cost before deciding whether to proceed. The implementation of that initial feasibility study tries to provide in a quick uh, manner that, that first blush, first look of whether this is uh, costly or feasible. In February of this year, uh, we actually posted on our website an update monthly, a public interconnection queue for all the projects that we receive over 25 kW. Uh, this provides uh, an insight to other developers, uh, the number of projects that we're reviewing, as well as, as timelines uh, of when those were accepted so folks can get a, a sense of where they are um, in the queue. Again, this is updated uh, on a monthly basis and is available publicly on our website. We're currently, uh, as we did with the smaller uh, projects, um, more residential in scale, uh, 
initiating a fast track uh, review process for for projects between 100 and 500 kW. Again, one of the issues with these projects is they are currently lumped in with the queue of a megawatt, three megawatts, up to five megawatts for municipal projects. Those very large projects uh, can require significant um, interconnection study and in some cases can have uh, impacts on, on a substation, which can be lengthy. Uh, we think that this fast track for these, these larger but mid-sized projects um, will help to expedite their review and try to get them moving uh, more quickly. In addition, uh, we have added, uh, added staff. We now have five uh, staff members, five employees that are uh, in our engineering department uh, doing these reviews um, and trying to turn these projects around uh, as quickly as possible. Um, we understand that there is more work to be done. We understand that there are more improvements we can make to the process. That said, we have been uh, diligently working to uh, address the shortcomings in our process, which candidly um, was designed uh, years ago for a much, much smaller uh, volume of projects. As you heard from a previous Eversource employee who was engaged in that process at that time, we have made significant and um, uh, meaningful improvements to that process. And uh, just to be very clear, um, Eversource's testimony, my testimony in the Senate on the bill is introduced. Uh, we did express concerns with the timeline in the bill is introduced, which would have required PUC adoption of a rule by December 31st of this year. The bill did not have an effective date until 60 days after passage. And then 45 days after that, the commission was um, required to open the proceeding which would have essentially started rulemaking in November of, of this year with an implementation of December 31st. Just based on a simple reading of the jail car rules, that was not feasible, and we pointed that out. Um, I am happy to answer whatever questions I may. Thank you, Mr. Licata. Everybody has a question. We'll start with I'll, Representative I'll do my best. McGee. <laughs> Thank you. So my question would be a follow on to just where you left off, which is that date was not workable in your estimation. So what date would be? Would, yeah, it, would we, it be three months after that? Or, you know, how, how yeah, tight we, of a we, process do you think we can engage sure. in? Sure. We, we think a 12 month uh, process would be uh, would be appropriate. Obviously, I can't speak for the Department of Energy and the Public Utilities Commission, who would both be actually administering the process. And I know in the Senate, they express concerns about at least the DOE expressed concerns about um, uh, sort of bandwidth and staffing in order to, to do that. Again, we are actively engaging with developers and making improvements to our process. We are adopting many of the best practices um, that have been identified in the IREC process. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to leave the impression that we're sitting on our hands. Can I just follow? I know other people follow have up. questions and I need to get out of here too. And I also have a meter running out. <laughs> but um, the follow on question would be, um, uh, around the sort of the losses of the folks who are waiting in that queue, right? There's a, there's an economic impact that's going on for folks that are waiting for us to do our jobs and for all of us to get our act together around rules that exist. They're, they're out there. So pulling that together another year since we waited from the passage of 262 in 2022 until now, uh, and we still aren't really any further along in being able to define rules that everybody can play by, so um, I, I would just push back and say that a year doesn't really seem tenable to me from a legislative perspective because it, we kind of slow walked the people that are in the queue already. So um, it, We're not do here you to think debate. it's possible? Uh, well, the question is, you said you think a year. So you're asking for the, the, your best case scenario on behalf of Eversource. But do you think that, there, that a shorter process than that uh, can be achieved? Yeah, I... I, I... I think the answer to that is yes. I, I do think a faster process can be achieved. And I think that, um, you know, whether it's ad hoc working groups or, or infirm world discussions among the parties are helpful. And I think that's um, uh, certainly can help move things along. When I say a year, that's a deadline. That's an end point. That's not, you know, when it has to be done. Uh, hope, ideally, it would be done faster than that. Representative Corman has a question. 
but he changed his mind. So Representative Munns will take over. Thank you. Um, you talked, you, you described some of the additional resources that you've um, employed to move things along, software, et cetera. Uh, what I didn't hear is um, human resources. I mean, you know, have you have you staffed up? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I apologize if that wasn't clear in my testimony. We have staffed up. We now have five employees uh, in our engineering department doing the the uh, interconnection reviews. Follow up. And do you do all of the uh, interconnection studies in house, or do you utilize outsource outside third parties as well? No, we we utilize uh, third parties as well based upon the complexity and the, the size of the project. Okay. Seeing no more questions, we want to thank you, Mr. Licata. And we're going to give the last word of the day to Josh Elliott from the Department of Energy. I'm sure he'll have some interesting things to say about this whole process. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Again, for the record, Josh Elliott, Director of the Division of Policy and Programs. Um, the department is neutral on this bill. Um, I think the problem has been laid out thoroughly by the uh, previous speakers in terms of what exactly the issue is that we're trying to tackle here. Um, I will stress this. Um, the department is being asked to do this rulemaking process. I know there were questions about the PUC versus the, the DOE doing it. Um, the 900 rules will eventually become the energy or EN 900 rules. So it makes sense if we're going to be doing, going to be administering these rules that we should go, that the department should be the one rather than the PUC doing this process. At a fundamental level, and as you've heard today, this is a disagreement um, between the utilities and solar developers that the department is being asked to adjudicate here um, in developing these, these rules. Talking a little bit more about the, the rule process, um, Mr. Licata sort of uh, outlined the issues that the department had with uh, the bill as introduced. We um, had those concerns because it would literally require us to violate gel car statutes. So in order to implement that bill as introduced, we would have been violating other areas of state statute. Um, the rule process, um, the, uh, and I would certainly encourage you folks, if you have not served on GELCAR, to certainly talk to your colleagues who have been on GELCAR or currently serve on GELCAR. The idea with going through a rulemaking process and why these are draft rules is because you want to sort out all of the areas of disagreement ahead of time. You want to present GELCAR with a clean set of rules that all the stakeholders have had their input on, that everyone can maybe not agree with, but can live with. If you have a contentious rulemaking process, that can get dragged out indefinitely, and that doesn't serve anyone's best interests. So the idea here of getting draft rules that can be submitted to GELCAR that's, that are clean, that everyone is in, I, get, I say agree, maybe, maybe a bit too strong of a word, but everyone can live with, is sort of the ideal situation. I know there have been questions on timelines and requests for a firm timeline. I get it, I understand it, but really it is comes down to how quickly can all the folks who talked here today work with the, including the utilities, work together to find areas where there are common sense areas of agreement and where there are areas of disagreement that need to further work on and to start having those hard conversations about where those disagreements are and what they can live with and what they can't live with and what's a red line for them. That would make this process go all the much faster. If there are areas that we can knock out and say, yep, we're all set with that, we're all set with that, we're all set with that, the rulemaking process goes that much faster. I will just add, um, as has been referenced previously, there are rules um, in the 900 rules that deal with small interconnections, so below 100 kilowatts um, in size. Above 100 kilowatts, it defers to the tariff, which are um, issued by each of the respective utilities. So for the small um, customer, for example, for the gentleman from Londonderry, I did give him my business card. We can have our consumer services folks um, get in touch with him to figure out his particular issue. But as you've heard today, most of these issues stem from uh, larger um, uh, arrays attempting to interconnect to the grid. So with that, mindful it is the afternoon already, I will, I'd be happy to take questions from the committee. Okay, thank you. Representative Corman does have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Elliott, for taking my question. Uh, so uh, th the first thing I want to ask is, uh, was it the DOE's request that the timeline was removed from the original bill? But I want to also uh, ask, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, that, that the timeline depends on how quickly stakeholders can actually agree on things. 
but it seems like there are going to be some issues where it's just going to be very difficult to get everybody to agree. Who is the appropriate referee then to actually figure out the actual rule? That is a good question. Absent any any of the existing rules, you sort of run into a chicken and the egg. Sorry, my apologies. Um, thank you for the question. To answer your first question, yes, the DOE did request that timeline be removed because it literally would have vi required us to violate other areas of state statute. Um, regarding your your question, right, there are areas where everyone is going to have to come into an agreement. The, the there's a bit of a chicken and egg, right? There's no hammer here that we can force everybody into an agreement on something because if we were to force everybody into an agreement on something with these draft rules, then it goes to gel car. Nobody's bound by whatever that, by our hammer. They can then litigate it at gel car and go through that entire process and relitigate issues that we have decided forcefully that, hey, this is, this is the side we're picking. This is what we're putting in our draft rules. Representative Kaplan has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is a similar question to Representative Corman's uh, about the process. Uh, can you give us an idea of what what the working groups would look like that would uh, that you would draw on to to make these rules, and and how public a process is, is it? Sure. Um, we would certainly, as like any other state agency, we would make this a public process. So any of the particular parties who wished to attend or offer input would be invited to attend. Um, obviously, I know there's certain time challenges with everybody about being able to be able to either offer quick input. So there'd probably be certain public comments versus somebody who's part of a working group who has that um, time or bandwidth commitment. Um, but there wouldn't certainly be any limit in saying, well, you can attend and you can't. Representative Munns. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Elliott, for taking my, my question. Uh, y you've acknowledged that um, this, is a, this is an issue, and that also it's, um, it's complex, and it's gonna, it's gonna be, the resolution of it's gonna be very time-consuming. Um, why do we need this statute? I mean, wh why do we need this bill? Why can't the, the department initiate a rulemaking process right now? So uh, thank you for the question. So GELCAR, as part of their process, reviews whether there's statutory authority to create rules. Rules have the full force and effect of law. Um, I don't think it would be good policy to have state agencies just making rules on whatever they wish. Okay. Who else? Uh, Representative Reynolds. Succinct question, I promise. Uh, my question has to do with your assessment and your testimony that... Um, rules would have to be drafted from scratch. Do you not uh, feel that the recently issued IREC model interconnection procedures and the existing Massachusetts interconnection rules where our state's utility ever source is also operates constitute a substantial basis for a rulemaking that you wouldn't have to, we wouldn't be starting from scratch? Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, and thank you for allowing me to clarify. Um, in my in my comment in the uh, testimony letter, uh, was reference to that there are no existing interconnection rules for larger generators. So in that sense, we would be starting from scratch. Are there uh, in terms of specific rule sets for interconnections for larger generators? within the PUC 900 rules. So it's not as though we are starting from something and need to make a couple of tweaks. It is a sort of a full drafting. To your point, yes, there are different models that are out there as part of the, the process that had been referenced to earlier. Um, there were six different um, potential interconnection um, models um, that um, had been offered as potential starting points. Um, those um, are, are starting points, right? New Hampshire has a slightly different regulatory scheme than Massachusetts or Connecticut does. It's sort of importing something wholesale from another state could lead to further complications, I think was referenced earlier. The What exists now for Eversource was sort of cribbed from Connecticut um, and has sort of outlived its usefulness. So just taking, it, taking an entire set straight from uh, one of these models um, is, is a starting point. I, yes, I agree to that uh, or agree to that, um, that sentiment but it will still require refinement and aligning with New Hampshire statutes. Thanks. Okay, seeing no further questions and having spent almost two hours on this public hearing, I'd like to thank you for wrapping it up for us and for being here this afternoon. And now I'm going to close the public hearing on House Bill 391.
The committee will now take a lunch break and return at 1.15 for a presentation by the Department of Environmental Services. Thank you very much. See you then.
Okay, 1.15, time to resume our activity for the day. And my first duty here this afternoon is to apologize to the folks from New Hampshire DES for not starting promptly at one o'clock, but we had a run over with a previous public hearing and it wasn't fair to the members to truncate their lunch break. So we appreciate you guys being understanding and uh, we also appreciate you being here. So what we're going to do for the balance of the afternoon is have a presentation from DES and the Air Resources Division, and you guys can take as much time as you want. We have nothing else scheduled for the afternoon. Um, so you're in charge, and we'll look forward to hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you for the invitation, first and foremost. Um, I'm glad you're all fed, because uh, I wouldn't want to deal with that situation. So... I can appreciate that. Um, you've asked for a lot of information today in our email exchanges with Representative Bernardi, so we will attempt to uh, cover all those things. I'll first introduce the team here. Myself, Craig Wright, I serve as the Air Director for the Air Resources Division. Behind me, I know you all know Mike Fitzgerald, the Assistant Director for the Air Division. To my immediate left is Ted Deers, the Assistant Director for the Water Division. And also behind me is Dr. Jonathan Patali. So if you can change the slide, Ted. It, it, Ted said he knew how to do this. So, okay, there we go. Good job, Ted. Um, this is just, I'm not going to read all this. This is the basic areas where you guys had asked for some information today. And we'll do our best to be prompt, provide information, and answer questions, of course. Seeing that Ted is here, we decided to put the Gulf of Maine offshore wind initiative up first. And with that, I'll just quickly turn it over to Ted for his couple slides. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about getting you up to speed for those of you who are not up to speed on uh, where offshore wind is headed in the Gulf of Maine. So I'm going to just, uh, I really just have a couple of slides that kind of talk about time frames, but I'm going to veer off from that and give you a whole number of updates in terms of what is going on both uh, regionally and as a state. Uh, the various different agencies, we are but one of several agencies which are involved in this work and we have a very active uh, collaboration with our sister state agencies and I'll talk more about that as well. But let's just jump into kind of the time frame and the process that's going on right now. So I like to say that where we are in the uh, Gulf of Maine offshore we wind leasing process is that we are at the end of the beginning. So um, the way that this works is several years ago, Sen uh, Governor Sununu, as well as some other governors, requested a task force for the Gulf of Maine to look at offshore wind. That stimulated BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which is the federal agency which leases out pieces of the ocean uh, for, for energy stuff. And so they convened this task force. The task force includes lots of people, many of your constituents from communities, elected officials. And at that point, that sort of kicked off this process of beginning to understand where leases might go. Where we started on this process was with pretty much the entirety of the Gulf of Maine. And where we are today is that they just last Friday released the actual wind energy areas, which incorporate um, some millions of acres of ocean, largely uh, sort of the south, I would say south central to south um, eastern part of the Gulf of Maine. So if you sort of picture uh, coming off of Cape Cod, about 30 miles off of Cape Cod and extending up about 50 miles from there uh, out in the ocean. Uh, at its closest point to New Hampshire, that wind energy area is about, uh, about 30 miles or so offshore. And at its most distant place, it's about 92 miles. For those of you who are, are tech geeks, which I don't know, at this committee, seems like you might want to have a couple. Um, what that means essentially for the Gulf of Maine is that we're not going to be able to have AC cable. It's going to be, it's going to be DC cable. So if you think about that, you know, just from a DC, if we can geek out here for just one second on DC, is that what that means is that that's, that's DC cable that has to be created, which is not readily available. There's basically one 
uh, factory in the United States that makes DC. And if you looked at all of the needs for DC cable around the entire offshore, uh, what's being sort of planned out in the world right now, um, it would take something like uh, 90,000 uh, person hours uh, in order to build the amount of DC cable that would be required. So I think that that just sort of puts this in perspective that there are some still some technological issues um, and the depth of the Gulf of Maine would require all of these facilities to be floating. Uh, again, technology which is now being employed throughout the world. There are several new uh, offshore wind uh, floating technology, uh, basically structures, arrays, uh, and the first commercial ones are just coming online, uh, Portugal. I believe is one, and then there's looking at uh, Southeast Asia is gonna be the other place where these are gonna be more common. So that's kind of the, the sort of state of affairs as to where this is headed. So the idea with the BOEM leasing process is that it'll establish this very long process, which includes lots and lots of public input opportunities to go from the entire Gulf of Maine down to a subset of the Gulf of Maine uh, which is what re released on Friday, and I will send that along to you after this so you can look at those maps in detail on your own computer because it's kind of fun to explore that. Yeah, go ahead. Jump in. Yeah. Thanks. I just want to be clear. The um, the decision released on Friday was just what areas are going to be leased. The leases now, themselves were not actually assigned. Right. So this is an area in which there were, there could be leases within these areas. So it's narrowed down to just these wind energy areas where there could be leases. What comes up next after this will actually be establishing where those lease areas are going to be and what's actually going to be released for lease, how many leases they intend to, to create, how big each of those leases will be, and all of the other, you know, accoutrement that goes along with the leasing process, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Henry? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, with regards to the leases, how is how is the cable, the, the length of the cable handle, uh, is, it, is it treated as lease property or a lease to, 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 to do, or is that, yes. is that going to be delineated on the ground? It will not be. This is a really good question, and one of the vexing, this is one of the most vexing pieces of the process. Um, and let me, let me come back to that question in a second. Let me sort of, kind of talk about where we are, where we're headed. If you have, I think in front of you, you have a piece of paper that looks something like this. It says, oh, it should be up on, oh, sorry. I didn't even see it there. Yeah. This slide here that you see, you see the star there, which shows that the wind energy areas have been, are, are now established. Those are the final wind energy areas. Where we'll be headed within the next 30 days or so is that they will have a proposed lease notice. That proposed lease notice then begins to get those actual lease areas and it puts the language of the leases out. So there's a couple of things that will happen with this. Within the lease, there'll be lease provisions, require people to do certain things within those leases, as well as there will also be bidding credits. So bidding credits um, are, are established to do, um, basically it, it identifies particular things that you're gonna have to do if you wanna, go in on this bid. So there's two different aspects of this and we're doing we're going to be doing an, an outreach session for stakeholders in New Hampshire on this process in about a month and a half so that anyone who's interested in understanding the ins and outs of that will be able to have uh, uh, we'll, we'll have a session and I'll make sure that you all are notified about that because that's where this starts to get really interesting. Um, some of those provisions could be things like, how are you going to make sure that fisheries monitoring continues to take place uh, within your lease? How are you gonna deal with safety issues? How are you gonna deal with other issues? And, and eventually we'll get around to trans, transmission. But the idea within that is that there'll be a number of provisions about what you can and can't do and, and money that you're gonna have to pay in order to do things like mitigation um, and making sure that you don't have environmental impacts and what happens if you do have environmental impacts. There'll be a whole series of provisions around that, as well as things like your financing and how you lock in your financing and what do you have to show at what point in the process, all of that. And, and then at some point you also have to, I think, prove that you're, you have a, a market for your electricity, um, which 
Obviously, New Hampshire is not participating in that activity. That's, we're not part of that activity. We don't do procurements here. But our surrounding states in Maine and Massachusetts will be doing procurements, and so they may be um, you know, actually having those, those negotiations with developers as they develop their leases. We'll be keeping close tabs on that as well. So the, over the course of 60 days or so, they'll have a public comment period on this proposed sale notification notice. They'll then, at some point in the fall, they will actually hold the, the lease auction. They'll hold the lease auction, they'll, they'll award those leases, and those leases will be issued by the end of this calendar year. So when I said we're sort of at the end of the beginning, this is bringing us to the point at which you're launching into somebody actually owns a lease. Once they have that lease, then they have to start doing all of the background work in order to understand where you're actually going to put the turbines, how many turbines, you know, uh, you're going to have to have areas to be able to, to get ships through. You have to identify where your transmission cables are going to go at that point, where they're going to go on land, begin to have all of those preparations. That becomes part of your constructions and operations plan. All of that will take probably out until another five years or so to get through. And then there would be uh, uh, opportunities for construction. There'll be met towers that go up over time. Yes, uh, Ch Mr. Chair. Do developers have to start paying on those leases as soon as they're signed? My understanding is that you pay some, I'm not sure if you pay all of it. I think you actually pay all of it. Like, I think you pay for the lease. Um, so that's the way it's worked in other places. Like in the Gulf of Mexico, they just did a lease, which was really, uh, there were very few people who wanted to bid on that, but they did actually sell it. It was like, I think it was like $4 million or something. But in Newark Bite, when they sold them, they sold them for $500 million. So it's a big company with lots of financing that can do that. Thank you. Yes. Does all of this, do the developers, are they, are they responsible for all of this legwork that you're describing? And, you know, and what, what role does the New Hampshire Office of uh, Offshore Wind Development have? Great, great questions. So, yes. There's, it's, it's heavy on the federal government because remember this is in federal waters. So they have jurisdiction over all of this activity because it's out in federal waters. The state does not have any jurisdiction at this moment over what would happen out in the Gulf of Maine beyond three nautical miles. The, so, so our role at this point has really been to make sure that our stakeholders who might be impacted positively or negatively, by this kind of activity, have lots and lots of information. And the other thing that we've been doing is making sure that we are well-coordinated as a state between DES, we are handling sort of the offshore siting stuff in cooperation with Fish and Game. Fish and Game has a very strong role to play on this for two things. One is fisheries habitat, and the other is the people who utilize fisheries habitat to make a living. So our fishing industry. So, so we've been well coordinated with them. The Office of Energy and Planning, that side is really much more sort of co uh, a comprehensive approach, looking across all of the agencies and really focused on the energy side. And I think you're gonna see a lot of uh, activity in the next weeks as ISO New England uh, releases a new kind of uh, long-term plan for, for transmission. When they release that, it's going to include some conclusions that they've made about how to plan for offshore wind. And so that's gonna be really interesting to watch because there's a lot of transmission issues, which we could do an entire couple hours on transmission issues uh, related to this activity because it's there's a lot going on there. But I would let our brethren from, from Department of Energy talk about that because they have people that are qualified. And then the, the uh, BEA is also in, uh, in, involved and looking at workforce uh, development, training, and making sure that there's, um, that New Hampshire companies get their chunk of the pie um, as this multi-billion dollar investments begin to get made uh, offshore. Yeah. You had a question, of, you mentioned that New Hampshire is not doing any procurement and uh, our neighboring states are. Could you, could you explain why that is? Um, I, uh, that, that happens at a, uh, way above my pay grade. 
Um, my understanding is that the, the, in this state, the, they have, they, we don't have like a renewable portfolio sort of approach. So other states are required to, to have some portion of their electricity be a certain amount. So this is what's driven it in Maine and Massachusetts, is that they have to come up with certain renewable amounts of their electrical load. And the only way, there is only one way in which you can meet those goals. And the only way in which you can meet those goals is to procure offshore. So that's why it's driving it in other, uh, and again, I'm not an electrical person. My understanding is that in New Hampshire, we have as much electricity as we need um, currently. That's my understanding. But again, I don't do this for a living. But that has not been the, the case in other states where they have these, these goals. So that's what's driving it in other places. Ted, can I just add? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I would just add that a lot, some of our states near us have statutory requirements in terms of zero carbon emissions by specific dates. And that's what Ted's really alluding to there. To get there, you need this type of development. Right. So, yeah, so, so over the next, you know, basically eight years or so, there'll be a lot of process going on. The developers will be funding lots and lots of studies. Um, and then at some point they will release, they will get their, their construction and operation plan approved. And at that point they can begin construction. So as they say, putting steel in the water. So down in Massachusetts, uh, you, you're probably aware that they are starting to spin and generate electrons. And so that's now going onto the grid. The same thing is going on in Virginia. Um, and you'll see, you'll see that that over the next, you know, over the next few years, those, those very large wind arrays will come online. The only other thing I would point out in terms of the leasing process um, is, is that um, a state of Maine also has a lease that they are seeking for a research array, which is way up, down, almost down east uh, Maine. And that will be an area in which there'll be something like eight turbines, and it'll be a test facility. Uh, for understanding some of the unanswered questions that currently exist with floating technology, such as, you know, how do you deal with EMFs from the transmission cables? Is that a thing? How do you connect them uh, from cable to cable? How do you connect them to the bottom? What technologies are going to be employed? How do fish react to things like offshore wind in the Gulf of Maine? Those will be part of the research array, and that will be, um, there's, there's a significant effort in Maine to create that sort of a facility. Uh, and they're working their way through this lease process. My guess is that will lease will also be finalized by the end of the year. Yes, Representative. Yeah, it sounds like, so we're planning to do something that has not been done before. Um, I wouldn't say it hasn't been done. It hasn't been done at the scale of an industrial scale. And I think that that's, and certainly the, you know, North, the North shore of Scotland is somewhat different than the Gulf of Maine, um, though both North Atlantic sort of enviros. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is, this is, this is at the bleeding edge of current technologies that are employed, but they're not that different as I understand it. And again, that's another really fascinating, uh, <laughs> the whole set talking about the technology, but as I understand it, it's not that different from the technologies that are employed currently for floating platforms for oil and gas exploration. The size is a little different. The scale is a little different. The fact that it has a thousand foot tower uh, sitting on the top with a giant blade on it makes it a little different, uh, but it's not that different um, as I understand it from a sort of technical perspective, ocean engineering perspective from current very deep water, you know, thousand foot depth uh, oil and gas, uh, you know, exploration. Yeah. Is the main pilot project also going to have floating? Yes. Okay. That was the, that's kind of the whole point is to make sure that it reflects what will be the reality in the Gulf of Maine. So they'll be moving along. Just, I just had this slide in there because it kind of talks about what we've been doing as a state to prepare our stakeholders for the eventuality that we would have offshore wind. And I will say that the, what we've been focusing on as a state, and we created a little group called the Stakeholder Outreach Work Group, which we've got agency involvement from each of the agencies, is that it's been on process, process, process. Because what this, this whole thing of getting these leases in, in place 
is a whole series of different processes that all link together. And so what we've been doing is educating stakeholders about the process so that they can be involved. And I'd say it's been very successful. The, the letter that eventually came out in terms of comments from our New Hampshire uh, Commercial Fisheries Association, it was highly influential with the decision making about where to put these wind energy areas. And that was because I think to a great extent, the work that we've done over the years of making sure that we had a really close collaboration between our fishermen and our government. And so I'm really proud of that and I'm really proud of where we've ended up in that process. Just a couple of other places that I would just note, um, DOE, the wind development director is currently vacant. Um, and so that's a position that, that hopefully will get filled because that does provide sort of that overarching sort of keeping track of things as well as the linkage back to energy itself. And so what we've done right now in the absence of that is that we have our group that we're coordinating. I'm spending a lot of time on this as is Chris Elms, who's their uh, deputy director. And so between us and between the staff at the four different agencies, uh, I think we have a pretty good coverage on you know what's going on. And, and they've been bringing their grid staff uh, to these meetings, which has been really helpful uh, for the energy side. Um, BEA now has a person assigned. They had had a person and then that person left. So they now have a person assigned uh, to work on this. So that's really great. You're probably aware, and maybe some of you sit on the Offshore Wind Commission uh, that Senator Waters put together a few years back. That also has been really helpful to be able to keep coordinated across both agencies, localities, and other parties such as the labor unions uh, and the Port Authority. All of that kind of hits together because this touches lots of different aspects of, of coastal life. Couple of other things, I guess. Um, there was recently a report that was done uh, by Normando Associates in partnership with another a bunch of other folks. I can send that link around to you all. It's a really, uh, I think, comprehensive articulation of all the sort of positives, pluses and minuses, the pros and cons of offshore wind to New Hampshire. How does it relate directly to New Hampshire? And I can send that around. It's very comprehensive. It's, it's, I think it's 500 pages or something like that. But if, if you look at it a little bit at a time, especially if you're interested in looking something up, um, it's actually really helpful. And there's a lot of really good information in there. So I'll send that link around as well. That was completed last, uh, last fall. And then the last thing I would note is that um, there's a compensatory mitigation uh, request for proposals out on the street. Uh, originally nine states and now 11 states have joined together to create a structured administrator for a compre for compensatory mitigation dollars for fisheries. So assuming that there's going to be fishering, fishing displaced by these turbines that they won't be able to fish in some of those areas, making that assumption and that that will have some economic impact on both fishermen and the industry that support them, that, that there, there will need to be compensatory mitigation for those folks. Um, nobody likes to talk about this because it's hard, um, because we don't want those kinds of impacts and we're trying to do all the minimization and avoidance as possible, but it is possible that there will be uh, impacts over time. And so the developers will have to put dollars into these compensatory mitigation accounts and so what's being developed right now is an RFQ to, de to develop an administrator that will serve those. This is largely being driven by NYSERDA, that is the, the, the authority within the, the Bight of New York that's doing all the wind work down there. They're at the point where they're actually starting to get mitigation dollars coming in the door. And so they're gonna need an efficient and effective way. And the reason why the 11 states kind of came together to do this is that we have people from New Hampshire who fish off of the coast of New Jersey. People from New Jersey have, have, have fishermen who, who fish out in Cash's Ledge. So, we, this is, this is, so when we talk about the fishery, there's not a state fishery. It is a regional fishery, and that's why this mitigation is coming together. So that's kind of the goings on right now. It's pretty exciting time in the wind world, uh, and I can try to answer any other questions you might have. John Lewicki has a question. Okay, thank you. Um, 
has anybody had one of these floating uh, platforms, wind uh, turbines, anywhere in the world where they got something the equivalent of a North Atlantic hurricane? My understanding is that there are some off the coast of the UK. So their weather, you know, I would imagine is relatively brutal. Um, but again, um, I th these are some of the, one of the interesting things is that the country of Norway uh, is actually really providing a lot of technical assistance to the rest of the world on uh, offshore wind. Um, and so they're positioning themselves sort of to be able to do that. And so there's a partnership that we've actually have with Norway. And if, for things like that, if you're ever really interested in that, we can uh, identify some, some folks to, for you to speak to with about, you know, kind of where the state of floating technology is today. Representative Mons has a question. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of different New Hampshire agencies involved in this in this process. It's a big undertaking, complicated. Is there one agency that is in charge, like the 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 go to place, um, the, the 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 agency that's kind of you know quarterbacking the whole effort? Yeah. So right now, I think uh, I would say that because of the focus. On, up until this point on siting, that DES has been extremely involved in that process because it's largely an offshore resource issue. And because we are, because of our federal consistency provisions of the federal, of the, the Coastal Zone Management Act, which is a federal act, we play a very strong role in that process, as do our other coastal states. And so we work very closely with those other states on that offshore siting, as well as with fish and game. So to date in the process, because the process is so driven on offshore information and resources, DES has largely led the effort for the state. At some point pretty soon, this is be gonna become much more of an energy thing. And as that starts to occur, then I think that you'll see that office of offshore uh, develop offshore wind development. I can't remember what they call it now. Um, that that office will become probably more key in some of this. So, but I would just say that at this point, the interaction between the state has between the state agencies has been rather seamless. So we've been working very, very, very closely, and we are aware of what each other is doing. So if you want to know what's going on, if you want to go to somebody, you can come to me, or you can come to Chris Elms. Because right now we're working very closely together on that. Representative Reynolds has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, notwithstanding all the all the talk here, including your presence, of course, uh, all the talk about all the government agencies, federal government, state government, coordination in this process of the development of offshore wind energy. Isn't it true that ultimately the parties that are going to build and operate the offshore turbines and the transmission lines that connect them to the grid, isn't that going to be private entities? Isn't that private capital investing in this energy resource? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Just wanted to clarify. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, Ted. That was fascinating. <laughs> Only took him a half hour to do two slides. So <laughs> at that pace, I hope you all <laughs> had dinner too. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. So I'll ask Mike to come back up and join me. Mike and I are going to tag team a base presentation that we actually gave to you folks a little over a year ago in January of 2023. We're not going to hit every talking point. We we'll want to keep this kind of moving along, but feel free to raise your hand, slow us down if you want us to clarify something. So first, I would just introduce the division's leadership team here on this slide here. Um, I would encourage anybody to reach out to any one of these folks with any question. If they can't answer it, they're going to find somebody that can answer the question for you. By my calculation, this group has about 150 years of service uh, to the state of New Hampshire at the department. So a uh, very seasoned group here. So, Mike. 
So this is just an organizational chart of the Air Resources Division. Um, I'm not going to run through everything here, but it, it gives you by what each one of these groups do on a daily basis, where their areas of expertise are, what parts of the laws they implement. Um, we're going to hit on them a little bit later on. So again, I'm not going to go into this. The only thing I'll point out is the director's office to the far right. We don't consider that a bureau, obviously, um, but we do more than just division management and budgeting. We have some technical programs uh, in the director's office as well. As well, and we're going to talk about those as well. I am just going to point out the Small Business Technical Assistance Program on the bottom right here. Uh, that's Sarah Johnson. That's a Federal Clean Air Act required program. It was in the commissioner's office until last year, and then it moved back to the Air Resources Division. So we're very happy to have Sarah back working for us. And she provides free service to small businesses trying to understand very complicated air regulations. Just as an overview, um, the Air Resources Division not only implements state laws, we implement the vast majority of Federal Clean Air Act laws, including monitoring for air pollution, developing and maintaining strategies to make sure that we meet those air quality standards. That's our job one, is to make sure that New Hampshire meets those federal air quality standards. It's very important to us from a public health standpoint. It's very important to us from a business standpoint. Um, we currently have 38 chapters of administrative rules. We've adopted hundreds of federal new source performance standards, NESHAPs, those are federal hazardous air pollutant standards and emission guidelines. These are largely federal standards related to smokestack industries. Uh, we think it's in everybody's best interest that New Hampshire have authority over those programs. So we take delegation by of all those programs. Um, ARD staffing, we have 71 full-time positions, currently around 10 vacancies. I think that's the lowest it's been in the last five years, so I'm actually pleased that we're getting to that point where we're getting fully staffed again. A lot of engineers, um, environmental life sciences, atmospheric science types, just a lot of technical science and uh, background as far as the agency. We have a couple of attorneys that work in our rules and that work in our compliance group as well. Again, I won't run through all these. Um, we implement or are responsible for a number of state statutes. They're all listed here. The ones I would point out that generally are the biggest players for us are RSA 125C. That's our general authority. That's where we get our authority to run our air permit programs, our enforcement programs, general rulemaking authority. Um, I would also point out RSA 125I. That's a kind of a unique program. The state does have an air toxics. Uh, control program. We set health-based standards for over 600 compounds that regulated sources need to demonstrate compliance up with. I'll also point out RSA 125.0. That's where we run our Reggie program. That's duly run by us and uh, the Department of Energy, although DES does most of the technical work. Uh, DOE deals with the money side primarily. Uh, the last program I'll mention is just 141E asbestos. We implement two federal asbestos programs here at the state, and they're in the Air Resources Division. One is the demolition renovation of existing structures and how you manage asbestos and get that out before you do that work. And then we also uh, implement the federal, what we call a HERA program, which is asbestos in schools program. There are a number of schools in New Hampshire that have asbestos. Generally, the thought process is you're better to leave it in place and properly manage it um, than it is to, to remove it, believe it or not. So, As a air pollution control agency, one thing we know is that air pollution knows no geopolitical boundaries. So we play in a lot of clubs across the country that deal with air pollution control issues. We know on some of our worst air quality days, the vast majority of pollution in New Hampshire is transported into New Hampshire from out of state uh, upwind sources. Um, so we work on a number of multi-state uh, organizations. Probably the one we deal the most with is NESCOM, Northeast States Coordinated Air Use Management. That's the six New England states, New York, New Jersey. A lot of success stories there on developing programs uh, across multi-jurisdictional multi states. I do serve on the board of directors of NESCOM, as do my counterparts across uh, New England, New York, and New Jersey. So um, we, we, we get a big say in what goes on there. So uh, the only other one I'll point out here is the Ozone, Ozone Transport Commission. This is the Clean Air Act developed uh, program. It, it actually recognizes the fact that no single state is going to deal with ozone pollution. It is You need to deal with it on a regional basis. 
This group covers all the states from Maine all the way down to Virginia, and we're very active on the OTC level. Uh, and the commissioner at DES serves on the board of directors for the OTC. So state agencies we interact with, I can't even name all these state agencies, but f suffice it to say, we're very active. We have, I believe, extremely good working relationships with all of these agencies. Uh, we work with them on various different types of uh, things that are related to uh, cross program. Um, so we're very pleased with our, uh, the way we work with these folks and uh, they know how to reach us and we know how to reach them. One thing beautiful about New Hampshire is that we are a small state, relatively speaking. And I think the interaction agency, not only within the department, but across state government is pretty good from what, from what I can tell from talking to my counterparts. Financially, um, we have about just under a $14 million operating budget. Um, we're very dependent on fees. Almost half of our revenue comes from fees. That's either stationary sources, folks that we permit, asbestos fee, and a very small amount of motor vehicle fees. Um, we're also very reliant on federal grants. Uh, that's the yellow part. That's almost 38%. Uh, our challenges with the federal grant is that our base grants have been level funded for probably 10, 15, 20 years. What I buy today for a dollar isn't what I used to buy. So it, it's been a challenge in managing uh, those federal grants. I also just like to point out uh, general funds, the air division of those 71 positions, only four of them are general funds. He has half of it right here, myself and Mike. Uh, so if you're looking for cuts, you can start there probably. Uh, <laughs> Oh, thanks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we have two other positions. And actually, John Patali behind me is one of those other positions and Mary Buto in our uh, environmental health program. So um, I, the next slide, I think, is a really important message. It, 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 I'm not sure if people understand this totally, but maintaining good air quality, we think, is important not only for the environment, but the economy as well. Um, one of the most important things I talked about was it's our job to make sure we meet those federal air quality standards. Right now, we meet all those federal air quality standards, but if we don't meet those federal air quality standards, that's where it becomes an economic impact in New Hampshire because we are forced into developing additional regulations to lower emissions, and that has a, a potential impact across the economy. Of course, we're a public health program first and foremost. Uh, clean air helps to decrease health care costs. I like to say New Hampshire is a beautiful state. I think we all agree with that. I think clean air is a good part of that. Clean air supports our forests. Our forests support our clean rivers and clean lakes. So to me, it's all intertwined into an important system. So <clears throat> again, I'll just mention this. It's EPA's responsibility under the Clean Air Act to set what we call these national ambient air quality standards. There's a number of pollutants listed here that we have standards for. Um, EPA is required to review those standards every five years under the Clean Air Act. They don't always meet that schedule. Um, they do a very scientific approach to establishing what these standards need to be. Um, and they also, um, like I said, uh, they are supposed to look at them every five years. I've never known them to go up. I've only, only known them to get more stringent over time. As science gets better, as better understanding of how air pollution impacts the human body, these standards tend to get tighter over time, and I think we got a graph coming up that will show that. Again, the most important thing is meeting that federal air base standard, I think. Oh, sorry, this is the right order. So um, we use the term attainment, non-attainment. Attainment means we meet the standard. Non-attainment means we don't meet that standard. Again, the important things, we're currently attainment. We need to stay in attainment. That's our goal. Mike uses a great analogy all the time. He talks about when you're dieting and you get to your goal weight, you can't go back to what you were doing before and eating cheeseburgers and pizza every night, right? You need to maintain the level of effort. That's a very important thing. That's essentially largely where New Hampshire is in terms of the federal standards is we're in the, a maintenance mode. We, you know, we need to keep the gains that we've already made. And I see a question. Right. Thank you. Uh, so last year when we had the uh, the forest fires up in Canada, did we go into non-attainment or we were skimming above it? Or So whether you're in attainment or not attainment, it, it depends on the pollutant. Uh, there's different averaging times. There's different ways they calculate attainment, non-attainment. Um, 
what we had in those situations were several days where we exceeded the standards. We certainly were above the health-based standards for PM, especially in the Keene area and a few other parts of the states. But the numbers weren't high enough to push us into non-attainment yet. So, because it's basically a three-year average of the highs of the fourth high. So there's a mathematical formula. So it pushed our number up, but didn't put us into that situation yet. So the other thing with- Will the new P PM 2.5 standard uh, cause attainment problems or non-attainment problems? I actually meant to put a slide in here. Right now, we believe we still have to complete the basis of that's going to be 2022, 2023, and 2024. So we need to get through 2024 to know for sure. But right now, we would still meet that new proposed federal standard. So uh, the other thing we could say about wood smoke, just real, real quick, uh, that's what could be an exceptional event. If those events were to push us into non-attainment, New Hampshire could seek to take those numbers out of our attainment status calculation simply because there's nothing we can do about that. That's a, that's a wildfire event. But so, uh, savings clause, that's the no backsliding. Um, that's, that's where the diet analogy comes in. Um, you know, we're, we're largely in that mode. Um, if we don't maintain, we, we potentially subject New Hampshire to, um, sanctions. Those sanctions could either be in federal grants, potentially highway funds or require more stringent permitting requirements for our regulated industries. So we don't want to get there either. Uh, air quality measurements. This is about 60% of where we spend our federal money, federal grants we get. Um, we operate 13 sites across the state, literally from the top of Mount Washington, down the uh, Connecticut River Valley, across the southern tier, the seacoast, up the Merrimack River Valley, and we have one monitor in Laconia, which is obviously a very popular place in the summertime. So we like to uh, monitor there. On the left, lists the pollutants we monitor for. We don't monitor for every pollutant at every station. We just don't have that capability, nor the resources to do that. So we're very strategic, and we work with EPA on an annual basis and on a five-year review cycle uh, to talk about what we're going to monitor for and where we're going to monitor for. So. Yes, go ahead. Thanks. Would it be possible for you to just provide us or have maybe give us reference later to a matrix of the stations? Yep. We have and a which station monitor do they monitor, you know, on the seacoast? Do we monitor for everything? Do we monitor for two? We have a chart that we can make yep. available which would identify each yeah, site and what pollutant is monitored for at that site. And Mike's making a note. <clears throat> Representative Corman. Yeah, just looking at the map, I mean, I see uh, stations in Portsmouth and Rye, which are awfully close together, and then nothing north of Mount Washington. So a couple great points. You can read a map very well. So Portsmouth and Rye, uh, we monitor ozone at both of those sites, and, and we purposely put two monitors relatively close together there for ozone because ozone has a very unique interaction with it where there's a water land interface and sea breezes and on offshore breezes and all that stuff. So it's very scientific that we we will often pick up something in Rye but not see it in Portsmouth, and they're only separated by less than a mile. So we did that purposefully. Uh, with respect to northern New Hampshire, um, actually last summer's wildfires made it very abundantly clear to us that one thing we don't have in the north country is a fine particulate monitor, which would be an indicator of wood smoke. So we are actually just recently got a, a grant from EPA that we intend to put a new PM monitor up north. Whether we include ozone or anything else like that, we don't know yet at this point. So we, we did put a temporary monitor up yes. there last year as well. Yeah. Okay. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it used to be when the mill was running in Berlin, you you would get readings from the mill. Yeah. Correct. Do, you do that with other locations, other mill locations. Um, Can probably. You project anything else in the north country the we we definitely used to have several monitors up in the berlin area i think sulfur dioxide was one and carbon monoxide was another um, they were specifically there to monitor air quality related to air emissions from the mill um, probably the only other site we have in the state that's specifically located for the probably the purposes of monitoring a source 
would be the Pembroke site, which is downwind of Merrimack Station. And we monitor for SO2 there, which is the primary pollutant of concern coming out of Merrimack. <clears throat> uh, the next slide, these are just some pictures of our monitoring sites. These are all stick figures. Uh, kind of, you, you know, these are probably eight by 10 sheds. Um, they all probably contain, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of air monitoring equipment. Um, we have field technicians that visit them on a regular basis. One of the things we've really invested in late in the last five to 10 years is because we don't get more federal money, we need to streamline operations. So a lot of this stuff is now automated. So it requires less you know, visits from a technician, but we still do need to go out there. And actually all of our air quality monitoring data from all of these sites is on the DES website and it's only an hour old. So you can get an update every hour as to what the air quality is across the state of New Hampshire. So. The uh, Miller State Park is a great one to visit if you're interested. That's at the top of Pacman Adnock, um, and uh, it's a great hike and uh, well worth the visit. But also, I just n a note that we have one of these stations in our parking lot at Hazen Drive. If anyone wanted to come over and take a look and see see how we operate, what we do there, we'd be happy to show you. And we'd also be happy to have you accompany us to Miller State Park or Mount Washington. <laughs> So uh, mentioned these are like eight by 10, 10 by 12 structures. Uh, we're currently putting a new monitor in Laconia using some real advanced micro sh shelter techniques. So we're going from a footprint of 80 to 100 square foot site to probably something that's three by three and a half. So it's a much smaller footprint monitoring site, which we think is going to save us a lot of money on an operational standpoint. Because think of the heating and cooling loads on these structures, it's a much smaller footprint. So we're excited to be working on that. I'd also just mention the site in London area that you see there is what's called an, an in-core site. Um, it's, a, it's a very highly technical site and it's also an educational site for us. It's located at a, the Moose Hill School in London Dairy. And uh, you know, uh, we, we have educational information for students and so on there. Um, and uh, it, we, we are one of, of just a few states that have two of these Encore sites. We have uh, the one at Miller and, and the one in Londonderry, and uh, they, they provide us with a significant amount of good science as well as um, air monitoring. So uh, if you're in the vicinity, it's well worth uh, taking, a, taking a stop by. All right, so the next slide just talks about general air quality issues in New Hampshire. Uh, historically, ozone in the summer has been our largest regulatory driver. Um, we Again, we're currently attainment for it. We still have probably a handful of days every year where we exceed the ozone standard, uh, at least in the seacoast area, sometimes across the state. Um, in particular matter, traditionally, that's been more of a wintertime pollutant. Uh, a lot of it related to uh, localized wood burning uh, during the winter months, heating season. I always say wood is good, so don't don't get me wrong by saying signaling out wood here. I, I do believe in burning wood. Um, just need to burn the right wood and the right device. So um, it used to be, like I said, a wintertime thing. We have noticed the last couple of years more and more incidents of Canadian wildfires. I just read an article this week uh, that... Um, there's still hundreds of fires burning underground in Canada. They coined the term zombie fires. So we're, we're watching that. Yep. They're expecting uh, another dry winter across northern Canada. So we are expecting uh, wood smoke issues again, potentially in New Hampshire. Last year, it was at levels that we had never seen. We didn't quite get it here in New Hampshire, but we all saw pictures of what was going on in New York City and Pennsylvania. Those were levels of air pollution that we've never dealt with here in New Hampshire. I mean, there's six levels on our scale. Typically, we get to level three or four, but we don't usually get to five or six. So last summer, we spent time working with Department of Public Health Services to come up with an action plan if we were to see those extremely high levels. And we plan on dusting that plan off this year again in preparation for the season coming up. Uh, regional haze, I'm just going to quickly mention, uh, we have to reach, New Hampshire has two class one areas. Those are special areas under the Clean Air Act. They receive special protections, and one of them is visibility. Uh, we have to reach what they call natural background conditions by 2064. So I'm pretty sure I'll be long gone by then. So I'm going to leave that to the... <laughs> <laughs> to the stat now just kidding we are currently in our second planning period uh for regional haze we've actually made good progress as a state in the region in improving regional uh haze and visibility 
in the class one areas it's kind of flattened out the last year or so so we're monitoring that and we'll continue to, to make strides from a very high level people ask how is the air quality in new hampshire and i think this this table here summarizes about as good as you can do this is all of our counties and our high elevation sites on the far right high elevation being uh, Mount Washington and Pacman Adnock. Green represents good air qualities and good air quality in the state. And you can see on most days, we're generally uh, 80 to 90% of the time we're good air quality, 10% of the time we're moderate air quality, and then a handful of times we get to that unhealthy for sensitive groups. And that's when we're actually exceeding the health based standards. This is another nice chart that shows ozone trends in New Hampshire. Uh, the red line here is really something that I want to point out. We mentioned that EPA does the periodic review of the standards, and that red line represents how EPA has revised the standard over time. Um, as you can see, it always goes down. It never goes up. Um, but if you also look at the data, uh, we've seen tremendous emission reductions across New Hampshire and across the country as a whole um, under the Clean Air Act and state statutes. Um, and as you can see, as a result of that, our air quality has improved, and that's the black line. It shows how you can see there were periods in the past where we were above those standards, but now we're below all those standards. So that, that's a good long-term trend, and that's one we want to continue because I suspect this standard will get more stringent in the future. Yes, uh, what's the main source of ground level ozone? So ozone is a soup. <laughs> it's a chemical reaction that is combines um, oxides and nitrogen. Well, it, it comes it comes primarily. Well, there's naturally occurring ozone, of course, both in the upper atmosphere and lower atmosphere. But in terms of man-made ozone, it's a combination of emissions of nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, and the presence of sunlight. And it's a it's a chemical reaction. Oh, it's it's primarily from cars, regulated smokestack industries. It's it's from us burning fuel at home. It's from transportation. It's from power plants. It's from coating operations. So, coating. The issue with ozone is that a lot of the pollutants that form ozone are transported um, and they come up the 95 corridor, the mobile source portion of it. But also, that's the prevailing wind pattern that, you know, if you look, if you want to know what our weather is, look out in the Midwest a couple of days ago. So we get emissions from power plants in the Midwest that come come this way, combine, and then and then when they come into New Hampshire, they mix with our emissions and then the sunlight. So the ozone can actually form here, but it, the pollutants that create it are transported in, and sometimes it's created elsewhere and transported in, That's and that's the issue. We see it rye also with the uh, uh, onshore breezes. Ozone goes out over the ocean and then comes back in. Representative Noel, did you have a question? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, okay, uh, just quickly, our air permitting program. Um, in New Hampshire, we're a fully delegated state. Uh, EPA has approved our state's minor source permitting program, and also they've delegated us authority of the federal Title V permit program, which is for major sources. Um, we like to, uh, we, again, we think that's a good thing for New Hampshire industries. Uh, if you need an air permit, whether it's a state or a federally based permit, you come to New Hampshire DES. There is a role for EPA, and I think one of the other slides talks about that. Overall, we have about, oh, I think six or 700 sources that have air permits in New Hampshire. We receive about 120 applications a year. Um, we have 400 or so sources permitted. We have a what we call a general state permit. Um, this is something we'd like to actually expand our ability to do where we establish a single permit and sources can register under that general permit rather than um, get a site specific permit. And that is a uh, fully online process. And Mike, you can switch that. Again, New Hampshire DES is where the lead on the federal Title V permit program. There is a role for EPA. EPA has the ability to review, comment on draft decisions, authority to object to a, a permit. As far as I can recall, since we've had this program in 1993, EPA has never formally objected to all of any of our permits. Um, there was a couple issues a number of years ago on one source, but we dealt with that. Uh, EPA audits our Title V permit program every five years. 
Um, my understanding from reading their audit the last go, go around is that we got a very clean bill of health from EPA in terms of how we run our Title V permit program. And then the only other thing I'll say about permits in general is any decision we make can be appealed to the Air Resources Council. It's a separate oversight board uh, established under a separate RSA. And if, if either uh, a party, a private party, or the company is unhappy with a permit decision, there's a process they can follow to appeal to the Air Resources Council. Representative Thomas has a question. Thank you. Um, just with regard to air permits, did the EPA review the most recent air permit for St. Cobain and Merrimack? We send all of our permits to EPA. Um, for state permits like St. Cobain, they don't have a formal role. Uh, like the Title V permit program, there's definitely a formal role for EPA. Uh, we send all of our permits to them. Whether they choose to comment on a state-only permit, uh, you know, that's obviously up to them. But yes, it was sent to them. I don't believe they commented. I just wanted to mention with regards to permits also, this year we have uh, requested one piece of legislation which has started over in the Senate, SB 449, that adjusts some timelines for us to correct um, uh, and, and allow us to be uh, comport with with the federal requirements and and um, that did pass out of the Senate committee last week and it'll hope I assume it'll be coming to this committee uh, sometime in the next few weeks um, and we'd certainly it's a request of DES and uh, it's it's to allow us to have the appropriate timelines um, and it's really it's really uh, I won't say a record keeping but it's it's very much a housekeeping type of thing that we need to straighten out and hope you're uh, we'll give it some consideration when it comes across uh, what we we can jump to the next slide I think so just our compliance bureau th these are the boots on the ground these are the folks out in the field inspecting sources um, these are the, the folks that are out in the field when there's an emissions test required in New Hampshire out of a smokestack uh, our policy is to be on site to oversee the stack testing. We don't do the testing, but we review the protocols for the test. We're on site to oversee the testing to make sure it's done in accordance with federal testing requirements, and we review the final reports as well. So we think that's an important part of that program. Um, we probably are out there 80 to 100 tests a year. Um, Complaints, we get about 70 to 80. We try to investigate every single complaint on some level. Sometimes it's a phone call. To, the, to a situation to understand it better. Sometimes it's where we send an inspector out to see what's going on out there. Our asbestos management program, uh, I mentioned that we do two things. We do the asbestos in school, the AHERA program. We do 30 to 40 inspections a year um, at schools that contain asbestos to make sure they're complying with the federal AHERA requirements. And we also oversee, we get somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,200 notifications a year for demolition renovation projects where there's asbestos being removed. Uh, we get out and probably inspect 10 to 15 percent of those. I, I wish somebody would say, can you do more? But uh, that's what we have the resources to do. So um, what else we got? Uh, enforcement actions, not our first choice. Obviously, we want to work with industry to make sure they're in compliance. Uh, but we have a number of tools in terms of enforcement, in ter including the ability to issue letters of deficiencies, uh, uh, put on administrative fines, or refer things to the Attorney General's Office for civil penalties. Our goal with respect to enforcement is to have a source get into compliance first and foremost, and then deal with the non-compliance issue after that. And then our other goal is to handle all cases right here in New Hampshire and have EPA not overfile on any enforcement actions. And I am not aware of EPA overfiling in any, any recent action we've taken. You have an idea of roughly how many per year enforcement actions? It really varies year to year. We actually put together an annual report on our enforcement actions. It can be anywhere from 20 a year to 100. So we could certainly make that report available to the committee if you'd like. There's also a very wide variety of enforcement actions. Some things can be very minor record keeping issues and others are, so num actual numbers of actions doesn't correlate to severity. Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just going back to asbestos, you, you say around 1,200 a year. Is that trending down as, as hopefully we're getting rid of it, most of it in the you, state? You know, that's what we expect, but we just haven't seen that yet. 
Um, there's a lot of redevelopment going on in New Hampshire, a lot of old buildings, old mill buildings, a lot of old structures, and a lot of that work's being done. You would think eventually it would work its way out. <laughs> yeah, you would think so. But long-term trends, we're not seeing that yet. Representative Noel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in general, with regards to the compliance and the staffing that you have, do you feel you're, you're, you're seeing the majority of the issues that are out there, or do you feel that there's still a lot of things not being picked up in your compliance efforts? I, I, I think we run a very comprehensive program, um, especially with respect to our permitted sources. We have a lot of regulatory oversight on permitted sources, um, either through a mandatory inspection schedule that EPA sets and we comply with. Um, complaints we're fairly good at uh, um, following up on. Um, it's the things we don't know about that, you know, if somebody doesn't report it to us or if we don't see it or if we're not there. Um, but I, I would say generally in New Hampshire, we have a high level of compliance in our regulated industries. <laughs> I'd also note that we're one of very few states that actually observes and uh, oversees every stack test. Um, very few states have, uh, have that requirement. I think, Mike, were you going to pick it up from here? Yeah. Okay. You mean pick it up speed wise? Or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've only gone a half hour. Yeah. So. But we so, can pick it up. No. Um, so, again, uh, Big mentioned one of our bureaus is our Technical Services Bureau. That oversees the air monitoring program that we've. Oh, I'm sorry. That oversees the air monitoring program that we've already talked about. Um, we deal with mobile sources, uh, again, vehicles, vehicular traffic, and so on. That's a very tough tough nut to crack. That's, you know, hitting people where they live and, and drive and so on. And uh, um, so uh, we do have a role in regional transportation planning. Um, we do implement, along with the Department of Safety, the Federal Clean Air Act required vehicle inspection maintenance program. Um, we have some voluntary programs. Uh, we also receive federal funding under the um, Diesel Emission Reduction Act for replacing diesel, uh, older diesel vehicles with with newer engines, and um, and and also we oversee the Volkswagen settlement that um, uh, put thirty million dollars into the state of New Hampshire. Um, we oversee the disbursement of those funds uh, for replacement of engines and that uh, that type of work. 15% um, of that can be used for implementing EV infrastructure, and we've been we've been uh, establishing uh, some some new EV sites in the state of New Hampshire, as well. Um, we also have energy and climate programs. We defer primarily to the Department of Energy on energy issues um, up until. You know, we didn't have a Department of Energy until a couple of years ago and a few years ago. So, um, but now, now that we do um, on the energy side, we defer to them primarily on the financial issues, um, on environmental issues. We we will raise issues and make sure that there's, um, uh, you know, uh, the environmental requirements are, are met. Um, we also implement. I'll talk later about the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Um, we were the agency that actually um, brought the RPS to the state, but again, that's primarily run by DOE now because it really is an energy market. Um, and um, uh, ESCEC is uh, the state uh, state agencies, the organization of state agencies that um, we work together to reduce reduce energy usage and and lower costs for state agencies. Uh, and um, then uh, we do uh, to pers we work closely with both DOE and PUC um, on, as environmental issues affect their uh, forces. So again, mobile sources. Um, I've talked about. Yeah, uh, sorry, can't do two things at once. Um, I've talked about these uh, uh, these issues here. So I think I'll. Um, oops, there you go. <laughs> We really can't. Do <laughs> Boy, can't keep my. So uh, yeah, again, uh, DRN and VW. We've talked about. Um, we in the director's office. We also have an atmospheric science and analysis group that um, does does our modeling work. And a lot of them, we we do model um, stationary sources before they get a permit. 
for toxics and, and other, other pollutants. Um, we uh, do maintain what's known as an emissions inventory. We determine uh, uh, the total amount of pollutants that are emitted in New Hampshire. We do estimates of, of a lot of different pollutants uh, and, and maintain that inventory. Uh, as Craig mentioned, we participate in the OTC in Mainview. Mainview is um, Mid-Atlantic Northeast Visibility Union. That's the regional haze issue that Craig talked about. That's the organization of states that, that work on that because that regional haze, again, is transported up the, uh, up, up the coast from a number of sources. So um, the uh, PAMS monitoring is the highly sophisticated in-court uh, sites that we, uh, we do. Um, that's a highly scientific, uh, PAMS is a component of ozone, and so uh, we, we measure that. We are also put out daily air pollution forecasts that the TV stations all pick up and, and are in the newspapers and so on, um, uh, every, especially on days where there's air quality impairment, those few days that Craig mentioned in the other slide. And we have the Citizens Air Monitoring Program, which where citizens can actually buy their own little sensors and uh, enroll them with us and, and measure uh, PM pollution. So a number of questions seem to be. Representative Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with regard to the measuring of PFAS compounds, can you tell me how many compounds you, you're looking for? Are they just the four that are regulated? Uh, as far as regulatory monitoring, yes, we have done we've we've done some stack testing and we have a lot of data on other compounds. But um, from a regulatory standpoint, the only thing that the statute uh, uh, gives us authority over is those four compounds that uh, have impacted water uh, in in the in the area. But okay. we do have we do collect a lot of data on numerous other compounds and have collected it over the years, especially in regards to say our requirements with the St. Cobain stack tests. Thank you, Representative Corman. Representative Noel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in in the interest of general air quality, does anybody in your department monitor for CO two? CO2 level. Uh, C, uh, no, CO2 is a is, is a pollutant related to, uh, you know, it's a greenhouse gas, obviously, yeah. and so on. Um, but it's it doesn't have direct uh, impacts like the six pollutants that we we did. And also, CO2 uh, is a very general pollutant, um, and so a measurement in a, a specific area is really not overly informative. CO2 in the atmosphere tends to disperse and it has a pretty general level and it's, it's that general level in the atmosphere that's a, that's a, a problem and, and creates the uh, uh, climate issues that we're, uh, we address, but we don't measure it directly. I know there is one station in Hawaii and I might have to go investigate that uh, uh, at some, some point. I think CO2 uh, is uniform everywhere uh, on Earth. Pretty, pretty much, yes, yes. There's Representative the Marshall. Yes, I assume you'd say the same thing if I asked about methane, correct? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the biggest methane issue is is oil and gas operations and uh, le leaking. And EPA has done a lot of work over the last couple of years and so on. We don't have a lot of of oil and gas pipelines um, here in New Hampshire. I mean, there are other there there are different sources of methane, but. Um, that's 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 the biggest issue, and and but it's also a greenhouse gas pollutant. So, okay. Neither Craig or I understand this slide, but, but <laughs> no, no. This just kind of shows we we have a unit in in the director's office called the state implementation plan, the um, unit uh, SIP for short. Um, the way that EPA oversees us is by what's called a state implementation plan. When there's an EPA requirement, we, we adopt that requirement. We put it into our SIP. And so this just shows that that SIP unit works to marry federal requirements, the state requirements, and um, a numer numerous others. Uh, to they, those, those go into our SIP and our planning um, group. And um, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, an, a huge issue for us nowadays is 91A requests, as you know, state every state agency 
Um, so we, we get a lot of requests for that. This is the same unit that also develops our rules for us. Um, Craig mentioned we have uh, 38 chapters of rules, I think. Um, I do want to make a quick point about rules because we've gotten a lot of questions this year. There seems to be a misconception. Um, all of our rules are adopted pursuant to statute, and, and every one of those rules is um, passed through uh, and approved by JL Carr. Uh, so um, we don't just go out and adopt rules for the heck of it. We, uh, every one of our rules has a strict statutory basis. And um, uh, again, again, they go through jail car for approval. So um, we've got a number of inquiries this, this year from legislators about why did you adopt this rule, why, you know, et cetera, and, and do you have any legal authority to do that? Well, we, we do, and that authority comes from statute, and that statute comes from this building. So... Um, uh, Regional Greenhouse Gas Program, we could spend a lot of time on that. Basically, it's a coalition of uh, Northeast states that uh, regulate CO2 emissions from power plants. And um, uh, you can see there's, uh, at, at, from time to time, states, New Jersey was in originally, came out, went back in. Uh, Pennsylvania and Virginia are, are going through different um, considerations right now. So, and so this chart will actually change this year. Um, as different states come in and out of the program. And the way the program works basically is uh, it, it regulates uh, any power plant, any fossil fuel power plant that uh, is 25 megawatts or greater in size. And we identify the emissions from those. We set a, an emissions cap. Uh, that's a regional cap. It's not a per state uh, cap. Uh, each state then issues allowances for the emissions that come from its power plants. Um, in New Hampshire, we have several sources, including the Merrimack Station plant, the plant in Londonderry, the plant in Newington. Um, there, uh, 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 you know, the, the Schiller plant used to be uh, one that's that's closed down now. Um, but uh, we. Uh, issue allowances for those sources to operate, and then the number of allowances, the allowance cap goes down over time, and sources have to purchase these allowances in order to to emit, and so that's they, they work to lower their emissions, and that program's been in place since roughly 2009, and uh, also goes through uh, reviews every few years. We're in the process of working with the other states right now to uh, to review it and determine um, if there are changes that should be made to that program. But that program is ensconced in statute, um, uh, RSA 125 And if we want to change that, we need to come to you and get the, uh, get the approval of the legislature to make that any statutory changes to that program. So anything that we work with the other states on implementing, we can't just agree and say, oh, yeah, we'll do that. We have to come bring it back here. You agree, then we have the... Uh, then, then we'll work with the other states to implement. Um, another area that we uh, have in the air division is our environmental health program. This program uh, goes across all the divisions, um, does a lot of work uh, on uh, uh, environmental health issues, education, uh, and um, also when we get receive uh, concerns, uh, issues like PFAS in, in Merrimack and so on, um, we have staff that look, look into those. They help us develop standards, um, give us an environmental uh, a, a, a health basis and a scientific basis for, for a lot of the work that we do. And you'll hear a little bit, a few minutes from um, Dr. John Patali, who's in, in this group uh, uh, relative to uh, PFAS health standards. That was one of the questions that was uh, asked of us. So, uh, and and we do work with other state agencies as well. Um, so, relative to PFAS, very quickly, uh, you all are aware that uh, several years ago, St. Gobain um, provided information to DES that um, uh, significant emissions that had come from that plant and those emissions uh, resulted in uh, groundwater contamination. This is one of the few pollutants that actually goes into the air, is deposited on the ground, and then gets into groundwater. And it created a very significant groundwater problem. Um, and so uh, we worked with St. Gobain um, to, first of all, we worked with the legislature to develop um, a, a statute that required 
uh, emissions controls because this was an area that we just didn't have uh, strong uh, requirements on other than under area toxics requirement. Uh, we worked closely with St. Gobain. We uh, measured their emissions. We did stack testing. We required them to do stack testing. Um, we actually worked with EPA to establish the requirements for these stack tests so that we did, did uh, address a wide variety of PFAS. PFAS is, as Craig mentioned, with ozone, it's a soup. It's, it's hundreds of compounds, literally. So um, it, uh, New Hampshire has four that are... are uh, the way that the New Hampshire statute works is if we adopt a water standard, then the water standard requires that the air emissions be evaluated as, as well. And we have four that we have water standards for. Um, so this is a pollutant that actually works backwards from water to the air, to the smokestack, and then to the control to the controls. Uh, and uh, that's a very unusual situation. <clears throat> We're currently doing rulemaking under the... Uh, uh, statute that was established in 2016. And uh, again, we've focused very, very closely. Our major issue with PFAS is obviously the St. Gobain facility, which has announced their closing. Um, and uh, But they have installed controls that were all directed by us, um, uh, a regenerative thermal oxidizer to uh, lower their PFAS emissions tremendously. And um, uh, that was all done uh, through our uh, through our permitting and under the requirements of the uh, RSA 125 uh, that were established. So again, the legislation SB 309 in 2018 um, gave us the authority to deal with these pollutants. Um, we we established the standards and required the. Uh, uh, emissions controls at St. Gobain, and now we're working on rules that would affect any other sources that came into New Hampshire or that might change their uh, processes and potentially emit any PFAS. Um, and we're in the process of going through that rulemaking right now. I think I... Um, so, uh, yeah, also that legislation did create um, Dr. Patali's position, and uh, it required us to develop a plan for um, for developing surface water quality standards that would then further uh, uh, further address different PFAS compounds. And um, so using that general fund appropriation, we were able to hire a couple of staff, um, including Dr. Patali, and um, it requires us to do uh, reviews every five years of the uh, uh, PFAS pollutants to determine if other AGQS are necessary. Representative yes. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, taking my mask off for this one so you can hear me. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment on the efficacy of monitored natural attenuation, MNA, as a remediation strategy specifically for PFAS chemicals. I would prefer you have kept your mask on so I couldn't <laughs> because I, I, that's not an, an area that I'm certainly familiar with. Perhaps, Dr. Patelli, does that have any? So that's what I meant. I was asking questions. You're, you're next on the slide yeah, anyway, John. I'm next anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, you, thank you for bringing us into that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's something that I would also still have to defer over to the Waste Management Division. So I know Mike Wimsett at the recent PFAS Commission discussed that issue about natural attenuation and where that plays into remediation plans, depending on what technology is available and feasible and what media is being assessed for remediation. So ultimately, I would still defer out to them. Yes, follow up. Follow up. Um, I'll for those who are not familiar with MNA, it, it is simply waiting for these chemicals to degrade. These are, however, forever chemicals that do not degrade. So how can that be considered an avenue of remediation? Again, you'd have to ask some of the engineers about that. With a lot of other, we call them recalcitrant chemicals that stick around for a long time. If we don't have the technology to break them down and we can't move them from a site, that's pretty much the option that's left. So if you don't have any technology to fix it and you don't want to move it and make it another community's problem, we run into that with a lot of organic contaminants. Okay, go ahead. 
Sorry. Um, so you're saying if these chemicals, because they cannot be broken down, will forever be in that area, would the state of New Hampshire uh, put some kind of financial burden on this company because of that for remediation purposes? I know Mike Wimsett. Yeah, because that's for the Waste Division Director. I'm a toxicologist. Yep. I'll just I'll just add very quickly. I think that one one of the issues here is that there's some thought that there would be attenuation of these chemicals if we eliminate the source, which was coming out of the smokestack. That over time, they, they although they don't break down, there would be a, some attenuation. Um, so uh, the the amount that's in the ground and in the groundwater will eventually de decline somewhat, but it's not due to breakdown of the chemical. Representative Noel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In Berlin, in the Androscoggin River, we have dioxin, which is a comparable chemical. It doesn't break down. And the, the river now has a Class C uh, uh, grade in that section where the dioxin is found. And it's my understanding your department comes up, I believe, annually and tests, uh, in, tests the river, catches fish, and sees if any dioxin is being accumulated. That's how it's being handled in the Androscoggin River. Yeah, so again, that's something that I would defer to the Waste Management Division for a more in-depth explanation of how those kind of decisions are made on attenuation plans. But that is something we do see with dioxins, PCBs, organic pesticides that have been used for decades, where if there's no technology to remove them effectively from the soil or to break them down there, then the question is, what's the alternative option? Okay. Okay, I will go ahead and proceed back into more PFAS discussion. So um, again, for everyone that hasn't met me before, I'm Dr. Jonathan Patali. I'm the toxicologist with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. I've been here since about 2018, working primarily on PFAS, but also some of my time is spent working on other contaminants that we have in the state. So my role is to understand how exposure to chemicals can lead to health effects and help make recommendations towards our standards that are meant to be either health protective or to also look at specific site investigations. So at things like Superfund sites, spills, other things that we have around the state and try to inform that. So when it comes to PFAS, I think everyone's somewhat familiar with this. So I kept my part of the presentation pretty high level because I realize it's late in the day and I just came after everyone else. So I don't want to punish everyone with chemical structures. But PFAS stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. This is a very large growing family of chemicals. They are characterized by having fluorine attached, which gives them really unique properties. One of those main properties is persistence and the ability to resist degradation. So when these end up in our environment, they don't necessarily break down on a meaningful timeline. These chemicals, like everything else, they do have a half-life, but that's on an order of decades to centuries. So us and our grandchildren will be long gone before several of these have actually broken down in the environment. What is concerning for several of these is that there is potential for exposure, and that is primarily through ingestion or drinking water. That is the main way that these chemicals get into most people's bodies. When we look around the state, so if you're looking at this map here, these are just private well results from across New Hampshire. And where it is green means it is below our standard. Where it is orange or yellow, it is above our state standard. And where it is red, that means it is even higher than the EPA's previous unenforceable advisory for these compounds. If you actually pull up one of our maps that we do have on our website, you can also see that these compounds are detected in all of our soils. And part of that is because of releases from industrial sites, releases from old landfill sites or where people had waste. And there's also potential that these may be long range transported compounds in the atmosphere. So for my role at the state, it's trying to understand how do these impact people's health? And this is a rapidly area or rapidly evolving area of research. So one of the things I also do in my role is I participate in a lot of interstate work groups that works amongst different states. We also work with our federal partners. We also work with folks in the private research sector and at the local universities to try to understand what are the issues with PFAS? How do we think about cleanup of these, reducing exposure? And even here in New Hampshire, our program, the environmental health program has been really successful in leveraging small amounts of state funds to secure large federal funding to investigate specific local PFAS concerns. So one of those issues is basically what I call magic, where we took $10,000 from our own state funding, 
we matched it with Dartmouth and we got a $1 million grant to understand PFAS impacts on some of our coastal ecosystems. So it's trying to leverage those resources, our state expertise, but we're also trying to bolster up the ability of local research institutions to answer some of these questions. So it's not always the department having to use our state funding to address these problems. Because sometimes we have issues related to site investigations that we need to look into, but there can also be broader research questions that we're not a research institution and we're not staffed or resourced to answer some of those questions. So I'm really proud of a lot of the partnerships that we developed within the state and we're really actually building a lot of that capacity to do more work here. Now, one of the questions I believe we got in an email was explaining the associations and causation relationship between PFAS health effects and exposure. And this is something that has been reviewed in a lot of different settings by either federal agencies, international groups, independent panels, various programs that the federal government, including the National Toxicology Program, where they've looked at this and they have found that there are a lot of associations between PFAS, but right when we think about associations being causation, that's not the case. But what they have also looked at is the issue of, is there biological plausibility? Right? So when we look inside of animal model studies, when we look in human cell lines that have been isolated, when we look in cohort studies that are held by the National Cancer Institute, do we see some of these relationships and effects holding up? And we do. So a lot of these seem to be focused on effects on the immune system, basic changes in lipid metabolism and liver toxicity, and some changes in the hormones of our endocrine system. And right now, actually, the carcinogenicity is being reevaluated by the US EPA, because based on the available evidence that they have to date, they're looking at reclassifying these as known carcinogens, at least one of the compounds. There have been some other groups that have looked at this, but these are all sort of groups that are kind of the same concern, basically, that we see a lot of these associations. There's a lot of evidence for biological plausibility there. So it's not just coincidence. But what I will say is there's a lot of debate about the magnitude of it. And that is one of the areas that there is still uncertainty. That's one of the reasons where we see new health assessments coming out all the time about this, is that question of what's the strength of that relationship. So sort of the analogy that I give is, if everyone in here spontaneously started seeing five cents go into your bank account every day that you never saw before, that is still significant. What would be more significant is if your bank account changed by 5% every day. That would be more significant. That's one of the things that's being debated, and that's actually sort of behind where EPA has come up with their proposed standards that have not been finalized of lowering the standard for PFOA, well, actually establishing a standard because they didn't have an enforceable number before, but for PFOA and PFOS to four parts per trillion. Currently, New Hampshire has MCLs, which are enforceable drinking water standards for four of these compounds. We have individual numbers for those. For two of them, EPA has proposed separate numbers, and then there's a family of four PFAS that they've called a hazard index, and I didn't include a slide that's a bunch of algebra, but if anyone wants to see how that's done, I'm happy to do it. One thing to bear in mind is this is a proposed standard. We are still waiting for them to finalize that in the coming weeks, maybe. Um, it seems to depend on who you talk, at, talk to at the EPA, where it goes from weeks to months to maybe the end of the year. We're not entirely sure at this point. But something that's important to note is these are for public water systems. These are enforceable standards. In New Hampshire, we do have a groundwater standard, which is one of the things that drives a lot of that private well testing that we did and recommending people to pursue treatment. That's one of the reasons we have a rebate program in the state. It's because nearly 47% of our residents in the state are on private wells. They're not on public water systems that have the resources to look into putting treatment on like this. So again, we regulate for these in drinking water. Our department is looking at proposing essentially soil standards for an additional set of these compounds in the coming year. That's still something that is being proposed and evaluated. It would be a rule that would come from our waste division. But we're also looking at setting for a limited number of surface water bodies, similar standards, because they are surface water bodies that are used as drinking water supplies for certain communities. But PFAS exposure is multifaceted. It's not just drinking water. It's also 
food packaging, consumer products, we're exposed to these compounds in a lot of ways. And that's sort of what makes these unique compared to a lot of other contaminants that we've tried to evaluate. Oh, sorry. Sure. Um, knowing that there's over 14,000 different PFAS chemicals, what would it take for New Hampshire to recognize PFAS chemicals as a class? So one of the things that we'd run into is actually understanding which PFAS occur and which ones we can measure for and actually having a way to treat them like a class that way. So I know in current legislation, I believe on product packaging, they define PFAS as any carbon compound with a fluorine on it. We don't have an ability to measure all of those. So we can't know if they're actually there or present. And even when it comes to the larger 14,000 that could potentially be out there, a lot of those are cast numbers for compounds that simply aren't used in commerce. They haven't made their way into the United States. They're hypothetical compounds that can be designed in a computer software and then assigned a CAS number. So we would really focus more on which compounds can we detect? Can we actually measure for them? What can we treat for? Those would be a lot of the other considerations that would go behind setting a standard. Um, with regard to the, the number of chemicals, I know that um... I think I had read that in the evaluation of the, uh, the, the exhaust from St. Cobain, there were 108 PFAS chemicals that were not identified, that they were detected but, but not identified. Mm -hmm. um, why is the state of New Hampshire not getting a list of the chemicals that are being used and distributed from that facility? So that would be a question either for waste management again Again, because that would come down to one, what are the actual reporting requirements for what a company brings in? And also, do they actually know which PFAS are coming in raw product? So that's one of the things that with a lot of folks looking at PFAS across the country, there's this big thing of intentional addition where you can also have various PFAS that show up in a lot of products that are unintentionally added. And even with something coming out of a stack or going through a process, if it's a byproduct of that, then that's different than having someone report something that's inside of a product that they're using. And I suggest you get his card and she has my email. Maybe do a lot of this questioning offline. Yep. It's ten minutes of three, so. So again, just one of the challenges with PFAS compared to a lot of other contaminants, even things like dioxins that were mentioned earlier, is these are in a lot of different media. It's not just a water issue. It's not just a soil issue. It's we're finding it in a lot of different places, and that's what's making it sort of unwieldy and challenging to deal with. And that's also why it's getting a lot of attention, because we haven't had a class of contaminants that affects so much different media like this before. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, and I realize we're all over the map, but um, trying to get a handle on you know how serious these various things are uh, relatively, and the other one, which is the elephant that's been in the room for a, well, it's been here forever, is arsenic. And you know, in terms of uh, the danger to humans, how do they all compare? Is there some way of rating them comparatively? So we do have some ways of comparing those. It's basically where we compare doses. The issue is that they often cause different effects. So we run into a problem of we're comparing apples to oranges. We can still compare the mass of an apple to an orange, but it's still not quite the same comparison. For pretty much any of these contaminants, when it comes to drinking water, if something is classified as a carcinogen, our goal becomes zero. And the limit that's set there is what we think is feasible and what people are willing to pay to get that out of public water. And that's where the number four came from for EPA's number. It's not the definitive number that is safe according to them. It's a number that we can reliably detect at this point. So we do have more information on our website. Um, there's a bunch of YouTube videos that also include presenting on the different work that we've been doing, whether it's from the waste division, from my own program, from work we've been doing with our academic partners, outreach we've done to different communities and trying to understand what concerns are. So with that, I just wanted to open up for questions because I realize we're near the end of this and people may have specific things that they want to get into. 
So when I was looking at the map with the green and the red dots, mm -hmm. one of the red dots looked like it was right at my house. Oh. <laughs> I'm in Lebanon. Uh, it's the only red dot around. So uh, if I have a constituent or myself who wants to get their well tested, to whom do I direct them? You can either direct them right to my email information, or if you go to this website here, pfasdes.nh.gov, we have a survey monkey tool that they can go fill out their information and they can get in line for us to send a sampler out to their house. When we do that PFAS test, it's a test for, I believe, 27 PFAS right now is what the analyte list is covering. But we also do the other standard well test for a lot of the other contaminants that a lot of people haven't ever tested for, we're learning. That way, if they need to get some sort of treatment system installed, they're not just sort of ambulance chasing the one contaminant, they're getting the slew of everything that could be a concern and get the right technology. And there is a rebate program right now that if they are above the state standards, they can get up to $5,000 for whole house treatment, or if it's feasible where they're at, up to about, I believe, $10,000 to connect to public water. Okay, no other questions, okay. I guess. Oh, Lucius Partial has a question. All right, Mr. Chair, I know it's getting late. The only thing we had left, I think, was to give an update on the status of the CPRG mic. Is that right? So Mike's going to do that. The only thing I want to kick it off with, and I don't know if Mike's going to cover this, but when we applied for this grant funding from EPA, the timelines that EPA put on the state agency were <laughs> unbelievably aggressive. And I'm just going to give a shout out to some of my staff while Mike's looking this up. Uh, James Tilly, Jen Galbraith, Kurt Yingling, and Brandon Wayman did an amazing job in meeting these timelines. We're not there yet. We still have more timelines coming up, but Mike's going to cover all that. But I felt the need to give a shout out to my staff for, for meeting that initial March 1st timeline, which was incredibly aggressive. So I'm not sure why this is showing the way that it is right now, but you also have this in, on paper, except that... Oh, is it? Oh, good. Okay. So, um, and uh, I apologize at nine o'clock last Monday night when uh, we were out of our building for some construction and I thought we were supposed to be here for this presentation last week. Uh, apparently, I couldn't count very well. And so, uh, the uh, I think I left off over on the corner here in terms of this, this presentation, but uh, it will be available. I'll send it to Christy and there may be some extra copies out there. So, um, so again, I'm just going to quickly address the uh, uh, CPRG. As Craig mentioned, we received a uh, federal government grant um, of $3 million to uh, produce a what's called a preliminary climate action plan. The intent of that plan is to set New Hampshire in a position to where we could apply for approximately $4.6 billion in federal funding, a, a portion of, not just New Hampshire. Um, and and uh, so the uh, requirement was to produce this uh, preliminary climate action plan over the course of the fall. We did engagement around the state. We got a lot of input from stakeholders. We reached out to um, uh, a wide variety. One emphasis of this program is also to provide benefits to what are known as EJ areas, um, uh, low income and disadvantaged areas. 40% of the benefit um, uh, needs to go there. So we engaged the uh, uh, low income uh, community in New Hampshire and um, did, did a lot of outreach work presenting this, uh, held several seminars, webinars uh, over the fall and winter. And we um, met that very aggressive timeline of producing the PCAP um, by March 1st. We submitted that um, on, on March 1st to EPA. And uh, that put us in a position where we could then apply uh, f uh, April 1st. Uh, our application is due for that portion of federal funding that would go uh, uh, potentially go to New Hampshire. Our intent is to apply for what's known as a, de a certain tier of that funding, which is up to 50 million. We're going to apply for that. We're also part of statewide coalition that uh, of number of states. Uh, one coalition led by Hawaii and 13 other states um, is applying for money to be used for resilience for municipal 
uh, facilities such as wastewater treatment plants and so on to be able to install solar energy and to be able to, at times when the grid is down, continue to operate. Um, and then there is a New England coalition of states that's applying for $500 million. The Hawaii one is also $500 million. And uh, they're applying for a, uh, a heat pump coalition to uh, provide incentives for heat pumps uh, to be uh, deployed in New England states. So we're part of uh, those two to multi-state coalitions as well as our own internal state co um, application. And um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all the uh, components of the plan and so on. Again, I'll provide you with a copy of this. Um, hopefully I can... <laughs> well, this... Um, again, the timeline we've, we've covered, um, we, we've met everything so far. Um, we're working right now, um, I don't know how many of you know, but the intricacies of developing a $50 million application for federal funding um, uh, is almost, takes almost the $50 million itself to develop the application. Um, but we're, we're in the throes of that and uh, working extremely hard and I would echo Craig's um, work on the staff. We, th these people have been working weekends, nights, and uh, doing a tremendous amount of work. Um, the key components that we're seeking uh, funding for would be transportation sector measures, some EV charging, um, uh, um, uh, consumer incentives, public transit, uh, expanding public transit. Uh, residential building sector, there was significant interest in what's known as pre-weatherization and weatherization programs where um, pre-weatherization is basically before you do weatherization on a building, um, the building may not be uh, in, a, in a condition so you have to do some work on the structure of the building and so on before you can actually apply insulation and do all that. So um, there's a tremendous need for, for that type of, uh, those type of programs. Um, local government resilience energy, as I mentioned, and energy efficiency improvements on drinking water um, and water systems, those uh, in addition to reducing emissions, they also save money for municipalities on taxes, you know, the more efficient the pumps and so on are, the less electricity they have to use, the less cost. Um, and uh, uh, there's some pro also some programs on food waste diversion and also workforce development. One of the biggest issues that we have in this arena is we need a tremendous amount of, of you know, for instance, weatherization, pre-weatherization work to be done. There's not enough contractors to do the work and there's not enough, not a trained workforce. So that's a big issue and we're hoping to address that through some of this funding as well. Um, the timeline coming up is, is uh, in July. We anticipate being notified by EPA. Again, there was $4.6 billion. I'm sure there'll be about $100 billion in requests from states. So how that gets allocated and the way they, the decisions they make there, um, we don't know. But um, we anticipate awards being uh, issued in October. And uh, this uh, funding also requires us to produce what's known as a comprehensive climate action plan, which is a follow-up to the PCAP, and uh, uh, further some of this work, but also to implement the uh, whatever funding we do receive. And we anticipate um, of, of good, we, we, we have high hopes for the two coalitions that we're involved in to receive those fundings. And again, those are $500 million programs, so you know, we would hope to receive maybe five or ten percent of that. Um, so the potential for funding through the coalitions is probably greater than our our internal state application potential. But uh, again, that's all up to EPA. We don't we don't have any um, any say over that. And um, again, this is the broad objectives of the CPRG program, and that's where we are right now. So I'd be happy to uh, to take questions and end your pain. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, as we've Representative inundated Kaplan. you with a lot. Representative Kaplan has a question. Yeah, I, I just, uh, first of all, I want to salute your department and, and you know, congratulate you. you on meeting that timeline. It was, uh, as you say, it must have been a tremendous effort. It's, it's taken a pound of flesh out of a lot of people. <laughs> I bet. Um, 
I just had a question about the public transport. I mean, you, you yep. mentioned one of the goals is to yep. expand uh, public transport in the state. And since we have, yep. you know, practically zero public transport in the state, what would, where would, you know, like what, how, how ambitious is that? Um, it, it, it's ambitious, but it's also a, a relatively smaller part of the funding um, amount that we, we would apply for. Um, we've talked with bus companies here in the state and uh, uh, regional transit um, providers, uh, Manchester Transit, et cetera. So um, if we were, were to, again, we're applying for $50 million. If EPA gives us 20, you know, we're going to have to realloc decide how, how we're going to allocate that and so on. We don't, we don't know that. And, um, and so uh, again, once the, once the awards are announced, um, but it, it would go to people like MTA, Nashua Transit, et cetera, to expand their uh, uh, transit opportunities, and particularly in low-income, disadvantaged areas. And just to follow up, you're not talking about a statewide network of, no, any, of any sort at this no, point? No, okay. no, no. We're talking about enhancing existing programs, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, there may be some for smaller transit operators that, that you know, do local in, in, a, in other areas and so on. We, we've been talking with, with a wide variety, but again, it's all dependent on how much we receive. Okay, seeing no other questions, we really appreciate you guys being here. That was a great update and a great presentation. And uh, got lots to work on and lots to talk about. So thank, thank you thank very you much. I appreciate the opportunity. So that's it for science, technology, and energy for today, Tuesday, the 19th of March. We will probably be back here March 26th, which is next Tuesday, but I don't know that for certain yet, so keep your eye on your email. And uh, with that, we'll see you all on Thursday. Take care. Hey, Ned. How are you? Hey, good. Yeah. We'll, I'll send it to the PDF. committee and yep. it'll, it'll, it'll. Okay. I yes. almost did and then I nice didn't to meet you, want to ask you publicly about this option, but I yep. would love to see yep. Yep. In, in the transportation yeah, sector yep. measures. I would love to see New okay. Hampshire mm -hmm. do this. Yep. Right? We have some tremendous rail trail corridors, yep. namely the seacoast all the way to Manchester. Right. Yep. Lovely rail yep. trail. Guess what? It's muck. Yep. It's not paved, and that means it's a crapshoot, unusable.